thank you. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Santa Fe Country Club, where we're going to host the 2016 summer meeting. I'd like to start the meeting by calling it to order, and I'd like to bring Joe Groman up to do the flag salute and invocation. Joe. Good morning. Please stand for the flag salute. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for our all. <coughs> Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks and praise for the sustenance and fellowship you have blessed us with today. We humbly pray that you continue to guide us in having a positive impact on people's lives through this profession we hold so dear. And we pray, Heavenly Father, you continue to watch over our men and women in uniform who give so much in protecting our freedoms and our way of life. In your name we pray. Amen. Since we have a smaller group today, we uh, want to do a roll call. If we can start with this table right here. Robin, uh, good morning, Robin Shelton from Seacliff Country Club. Good morning, Todd Keeper of Wilshire Country Club. Uh, good morning, Tony Latender of the First Team Orange County. Bill Holbert, PJ Tour Superstore Irvine. Joe Grauman, Navy Golf Course, Seal Beach. Cathedral <laughs> Canyon. Manuel mm -hmm. Casada, retired. Mark Casada, Manny Sun. Mike Moran, Sunset Hills Country Club. I'm Borowski, Lost Troubles Golf Course. Al Swodinski, Santa Coy Country Club. Keith Dykeson, Pioneer Center Reserve. Jake Levy, Good Ranch. Stephen Alman, Legends Golf Club. Phil Lopez, Santa Coy Country Club. All Holy Golf Development Complex. Austin Peters, Golf Mill Complex. Steve Holmes, uh, Westlake Golf Course. Scott Mallory, Gurney at Tatonga. Randy Wang, Gurney at Tatonga. Dave Bartholomew, Riviera Country Club. Gary Grillish, Ranch Course at Alisal. <coughs> Zach Clark, Riviera. Uh, Derek Goodrich, Stockwell Country Club. Country Club. Travis Britt, Brentwood Country Club. David Brubaker, yeah. Brentwood Country Club. <laughs> Wayne Tiny, Van Nuys Golf Course. Matt Hollis, Golf Tech Pasadena. Scott McCauley, Golf Tech Pasadena. Mike Lynn, Sierra Laverne Country Club. Ken Conant, Sierra Laverne Country Club. Sure, <laughs> Chad Wright, River Ridge Golf Club. Justin Height, Spanish Hills Country Club. Leo Lee, Spanish Hills Country Club. 
Dana Rogers, River Ridge Golf Club and Spanish Hills Country Club. Allison Kerr, River Ridge Golf Club. Chris Lumpa, Torrey Pines Golf Course. Patrick Cole, Torrey Pines Golf Course. Mark Taylor, El Caballero. Brett Foreman, El Caballero. Scott Zola, Del Golf Club. Matt Johnson, Del Golf Club. Doug Crane, Santa Barbara Golf Club. Bobby Hines, Woodley Lakes. Dave Nanky, Virginia West Private. Trevor Cassidy, El Caballero. Chris Gilly, Lakeith and Country Club. Pete Jones, Corey Lakeitha. Al Kelly, Tamaris Country Club. Kirby Kirk, Callaway Golf. Randy Diesler, Sherwood Country Club. Eric Loman, Monarch Beach Golf Club. Ida Yoshiyama, Monarch Beach Golf Club. Mark Madsen, Lakeside Golf Club. Charm Miguel, Grant from Carlsbad. Joe Brown Danger, Robbins and Nice Golf Course. Mark McGowan, Mark McGowan, Mark McGowan, Mark McGowan, Rick Stiegel, Willem Hill Country Club. Randy Lerner, Willem Hill Country Club. Terry Young, Soul Club Golf Course. Jim Cummins, Rick Stiegel. Alex Lerner, Willem Hill Golf Course. Patrick Casey, Reverend Country Club. We have a group in here if you want to speak loudly. Probably. <laughs> <laughs> Blair Harkins, Rolling Hills Country Club. Andrew R.D. UCLA. Jamie Peterbaugh, Aviar Golf Academy. Thomas Two, Los Coyotes Country Club. Beach Tuttle Tongue, Rolling Hills Country Club. Corey Scoggin, University of San Diego. Ray Walton, Los Angeles Country Club. Tom Gardner, Los Angeles Country Club. Bob Reidbach, Palm Desert Greens Country Club. Jeff Brownfell, Marshall Ranch, you just trying to be Bob Kostowski, like three Elm Club. Wes Roberts, Los Angeles Country Club. Tim King, Los Angeles Country Club. Ryan Schimple, Roy H. Vico's Office. Tim Gordon Thomas, Henry Brothers Golf Academy, and Strawberry Farms. Under the Toy, Mexico Country Club. Paul Garrett, Bakersfield Country Club. Bob Evans, Miles Square Golf Course. Robert Handy, Miles Square Golf Course. <coughs> David Franks, Calabasas Golf Academy. Reed Kirky, Indian Ridge Country Club. Charlie Peterson, Indian Ridge Country Club. Eric Cheris, Sunrise Country Club. Simon Letts, Seven Lakes Country Club. Robert Duncan, Fish and Lake. Alexander Wake, Seven Lakes Golf Country Club. Thank you very much for that. Um, now I'd like to do an introduction to some special guests here today. I'd like to start with our board of directors and recognizing them. Not only put a bunch of time in throughout the year, but uh, they had to put up with a uh, six-hour board meeting yesterday, so I want to recognize them. Uh, starting with, uh, if you stand uh, when introduced, and we'll say applause at the end, uh, Mr. Todd Kiefer, no. Tony Latendry, Susan Roll, Steve Plummer, Randy Chain, Eric Lohm, Scott Hine, Rob Oosterhaus, Robin Shelton, Joe Broman, Steve Adamiak, Mike Vandergoes, Mark Wilson, Kendall Palou, and Bill Goring. Thank you very much. We also have four past presidents in attendance. Mr. Bill Holbert, Patrick Casey, Tom Addis, and Jeff Johnson. We'd also like to recognize some of our great players in our section, starting with those that qualified for the PGA Professional National Championship, uh, starting with our 2015 section champion, Chad Sorensen, the 2014 champion, Michael Block, Mark Madsen, Blair Harkins, Gary Sawinski, Scott Hine, Matt Gibbons, Pete LeCourcier, Don Luttrell, Jeff Munich, Chris Starkjohn, Eric Evans, Barry Mulberg, and Ryan Kennedy. Congratulations, gentlemen.
We'd also like to recognize the three players that qualified and played in the uh, Senior PGA Championship this past uh, week. Bruce Nakamura, Tim Peroon, and Chris Starjohn, who actually made the cut. Congratulations, gentlemen. Perfect. I'd like to thank Santa Fe Country Club for all their efforts hosting us yesterday for the board meeting as well as the meeting today and the golf course uh, just looks absolutely fantastic so we're very excited to be here. We'd like to recognize them and bring the senior managers up and present them with a plaque starting with general manager Phil Lopez, director of golf Tim Swidinski, uh, I'm sorry, Tom Swinsky. I only practiced with him four times, but I missed it again. Yes. Food and beverage manager, Alex Galavis, and golf course superintendent, Tim Paulson. So gentlemen, if you come over. Now we'd like to move into our presence report. If we could bring up Nikki Gatch, our PGA Player Development Regional Manager. Nikki? this morning on PGA Junior League Golf, which is what we've been focusing a lot of our time on so far this year since January. And I know I've worked with so many of you in this room with getting your team um, filled and getting you put together in a league and getting your matches started and getting jerseys on kids. So I want to just publicly thank all of you for your support and your participation in this wonderful program. Uh, I'd like to give a, a brief update on, on how we stand nationally and, and both here sectionally with just the great increase we've seen uh, with this program the last year. We've already um, uh, <coughs> met and actually beat all of our numbers from 2015 last month. So we surpassed the number of juniors participating. We're just over 33,000 kids now. We do anticipate you know, getting some more, but, but pretty much the matches are getting ready to start. We have over 2,500 captains participating uh, across the country, which is just a great increase. Here in the section, we had a goal this year of reaching 120 teams. We had just under 70 last year, so it was a pretty lofty goal, um, but we did end up getting pretty close to that goal. We had 114 teams register. We'll end up having about 97 teams that will actually participate this year. So again, a huge thank you to, to all of you for your support with that. We have almost all of our captains returning from, from last year, which is great, and we have 15 facilities that now have two or more teams at their course, and that just shows the impact that this program can have at your facility. Once, once you participate in this, in this program, once your kids start participating in the program, the families get involved, it just starts growing. Um, Chris Lempa, Chris, I don't know where you are, but he's a great example. In 2014, he had one team. Last year, that grew to two teams. This year, he has four teams. Um, so we're seeing a lot more of that um, with multiple teams at a facility. We're also seeing a lot of programming, extended programming, because of Junior League. The kids are so excited, the parents are involved, they love the program, they want more. So we're seeing a lot of our professionals and facilities extend this program throughout the year, whether it's having a winter league or a spring league leading up to uh, the summer league with PJ Junior League Golf. On a national level, uh, we have our national championship that will be back here on the West Coast in Scottsdale at Greyhawk, which is a phenomenal facility. We'll be there the next two years. That'll be in mid-November, so hopefully we have great representation once again from our section. With programs like PJ Junior League Golf and certainly Drive, Chip, and Putt, and obviously all of the great programs that you do at your facilities, we've seen a great increase in the number of junior golfers across the country. You know, that number of junior golfers has, has really hovered around that two million to maybe two and a half million number for really the last, almost the last decade, you know, since about 2005. And, you know, we're happy to, to report that in 2015 that number grew to three million. 
junior golfers, which is great. I mean, and that's a testament certainly to, to programs like Junior League Golf and Drive, Chip, and Putt, uh, programs like our sections, Junior Tour, and all of the great junior golf programs and tours that are out there, and certainly all the grassroots programs that are happening at your facilities. So to see that great increase in junior golfers, you know, kids can't get to the golf course by themselves, usually. So with kids comes parents and grandparents and siblings, and it's, it's just a great kickstart to growing this game on a national level for everyone. And something great that, that I'm especially proud of the fact that, you know, we've seen a great increase in the number of girls that are playing golf. You know, that number has typically ranged in that 15 to 20 percent range, whether you look at that at a, at a national level or I know that those were very consistent numbers uh, with our junior tour. Um, it, it was very consistent across the board. And now we're pleased to report that the number of girl golfers is about one third of all junior golfers. So another great increase there. Um, again, thank you, you know, for everything that you guys do, because that's a huge part of it. Following our junior league golf season, we'll go back to really focusing on more player development as a whole, doing some more player development consulting with all of you, some educational seminars. Uh, we'll host some uh, Cracker Barrel seminars at the PGA show in August. Uh, we'll be doing those with Bob Doyle, my counterpart from the Southwest section. So uh, look for some information on that probably in the next month or so. And if you were at the show, we'd love you to, to stop by and join us. September 20th, we'll have our player development section workshop uh, with myself and Ted Eleutherio from our player development team at headquarters. It'll be a great day of, of really talking about player development and, and what it means to your facility and how to showcase your value to your, to your employer. So really hope that you can join us for that. That'll be at the section office. And we also want to focus on the revenue scorecards. You've heard me talk a lot about that tool and it's such a great tool to really quantify what you are doing as far as player development at your facility and what that really means to the bottom line of your facility. It's something that you can take to your employer, to your general manager, to your board of directors and, and really validate what you're doing. You know, uh, those of you that, that teach a lot or maybe you're independent contractors, you certainly know what, what you put in your pocket at the end of the year, right? Uh, from your lessons, but you know, what, what does that really mean to the facility? You know, and, and a, a great example again with Junior League Golf. Sure, you certainly get the registration fees from that, but what comes after that? You know, it's all of these families coming to the facility more often. It's creating more camps or more programs because the need is there. All of these things. So we've created this great tool that's super easy to use. It's now in an app format. You can do it on your phone and you create this great report that again, use for your benefit, but also more importantly, share with your employer and your board of directors to showcase what you are doing and again, elevate that value of being a PGA professional. I would like to take any questions, um, if we have time, Mr. President, um, anything on Junior League, certainly, specifically, or anything on player development. Um, and if not, I, I really appreciate, again, all of your support and everything that you guys do on a day-to-day -day basis. You're how we're gonna grow the game. It's not any magical program or anything that, that I can say up here at a podium. It's, it's what you all do on a daily basis. So I know all of you work so hard and, and create these programs, whether it's for juniors or adults, and there's so many wonderful programs. I could talk for hours about all the great things that are happening in our section. So I just wanna take the opportunity to, to say thank you and, and thanks for what you do. Does anybody have any questions for me? different color jerseys or anything like that? Okay. Is that all? Okay. Thank you, John. Thank you, Amy. One thing to mention on player development, though, is everyone knows, I believe, we have our golf and schools program, and we're in three territories right now. Uh, two in Orange County and one in North San Diego County. And on the player development side, one area we could do, use a lot of help in for those particularly in Orange County and San Diego County, is we need instructors to teach those programs. Uh, you get $50 uh, for teaching a one-hour instruction. So if you or any of your team members at your golf course have interest in that or you're in your apprentices, it's a great way to get some experience uh, teaching the game of golf as well as uh, introducing the game to a bunch of beginner golfers that are fresh, basically in grade school and middle school. So it's a great experience. So please keep that in mind, and thank you once again, Nikki. Uh, with that, I'd like to bring up Mr. Ken Farrell. Ken's going to talk about uh, PJ employment. Ken? <clears throat> Is 
the squire will clap and then bring you up. I get very few of those with my golf game, so I appreciate any that I can get for sure. Um, you know, I want to start out by actually echoing something that Nikki said, and we probably don't say enough, and that's uh, how hard you all work to grow the game and what you mean to uh, this industry, to the association, as well as the section. Uh, uh, things happen because of you and how hard you work and what you do every day. Um, and so we're, we're very appreciative of that. And, and uh, so we want to thank you for that for sure. Um, a couple of things, uh, Rob Oosterhouse is the employment chair for the section and uh, he's reached out to the chapters and the committee is uh, comprised of somebody that's on the board of each chapter as well as Rob. And I think this year, probably the uh, real initiative is to reach out um, and we really truly need your help when it comes to opportunities that are available out there. You know, employment in uh, our section has remained pretty consistent. The employment rate, the unemployment rate has remained pretty consistent throughout the last seven years since I've been doing this position. Uh, and uh, um, there's a lot of jobs out there. The question is, are there jobs that we choose to seek for sure? Uh, we just want to make sure the great opportunities are getting to us so that we can actually get them to other PGA professionals and fill those opportunities. Um, so two things. If you hear that there's a position available out there, please reach out to your chapter. You can reach out to Rob at Sherwood Country Club, or you can always reach out to me. You can go to scpga.com. Uh, you, uh, you can go to pga.org. Uh, my telephone numbers are on both of those. Uh, or you can reach out to somebody else that uh, knows how to contact me. So we'd appreciate your help uh, with that. Um, with regards to jobs, you know that uh, the two posting sites, actually CareerLinks is not a posting site. Uh, it's actually a management um, program where you complete your profile and then once a job matches your profile, it gets sent to you via email. Um, and so continue to update that profile, especially for those of you that are seasonal, and you may go from section to section as well because that constantly changes, and by updating your profile as well as uh, potentially other sections that you may want to travel to, um, jobs come out at a certain time. For example, desert jobs come out uh, in the summertime when there's downtime and preparing for their uh, uh, upcoming season. So it changes constantly. Um, my suggestion is that you go in there and change that probably every three, four months, or at least reevaluate it and update your information. PGA Job Finder, right now, uh, is something that needs to be a lot better. Uh, there's con some concerns about how effective it is. So the PGA of America has reached out to, to a company that's going to create a brand new digital platform that's going to create more interaction. Um, you're going to see a complete revision ultimately of PGA Job Finder. It's going to be more of a, uh, a profile, something more similar to PGA Career Links, um, a better communication tool for one for you as employers posting positions. Um, and finding help, and then the other thing is for you seeking positions. Keep in mind, PJ Job Finder is for non-management positions. With regards to management companies, if you're seeking positions, management companies post jobs on their own websites. In a lot of cases, they like to find people internally first, give them the opportunity to move up. Almost every management company has a career area on their website. I have a list of those management companies. Southern California has a lot of management companies. The reason I say that is, I was telling the uh, board of directors yesterday that the last eight of 13 positions posted in Southern California were posted by other employment consultants. And the reason is, is because they oversee uh, management companies that are headquartered in their area. So for example, I oversee all postings for American Golf. If there's a posting to be posted in New York, I would post that because American Golf is headquartered here in Southern California. By the same token, true, and I think is in Phoenix, Club Corp is in Dallas, Billy Casper I think is out of Florida. Those employment consultants would uh, 
who post those positions. It really doesn't matter who posts those positions. It matters whether you're getting those postings together. Uh, that goes back to your profile. So again, if you want help with your profile to make sure that you get those postings, please reach out to me. I promise you I can help you improve so that you can receive more postings. With regards to international programs, for the past six months I've been posting international uh, positions now um, around the world. It's something that PG of America is really trying to focus on because we believe there's a lot of opportunities out there. Um, I will caution you that anytime you look at an international position to, um, first off, if they ever ask you to send money for expenses, don't do that. It's probably not a real job. There's actually a lot of scams with regards to international positions. But a lot of those are real positions. And I'll give you a perfect example. I posted one in Panama the other day. And uh, it's a Jack Nicholas private club down in Panama. I can't tell you what it's like living down in Panama. Um, I was offered a position one time in Vietnam to open a golf course. Uh, it looked pretty attractive. The first thing I thought of what is, I wonder if there's any PGA professionals in Vietnam that are working there that can tell me what it's like to live there. And lo and behold, I reached out, we had three PGA professionals there, and they gave me a pretty good understanding of what that was like. It was a real opportunity, and it looked like a pretty good opportunity. Not one that I took, but looked like a pretty interesting opportunity. So those positions are out there. We've hired a firm. The PGA of America has hired a firm to help us with that. That firm is already out there. Uh, in employment uh, for international positions, so you'll start to see a lot more of those come. If you're interested in getting those postings, go to your profile and make sure that you list those countries that you might be interested in. We're not trying to get rid of you in the Southern California section, but uh, by the same token, if a great opportunity comes over and that's something you're interested in, um, we want to make sure, first off, that it's a real position, and the second thing is that you get the posting if you're interested. The compensation survey is now live. Uh, the 2015 compensation survey actually came out last week. Uh, that's something that you participated in. We had about 57% participation uh, in the Southern California section. Overall, nationally, we had a 63% participation rate. Uh, the compensation survey is the highest uh, percentage of participation of any PGA survey that's put out there. So uh, my thanks to all of you for completing that. The reason it's so important that you complete that is because it's information that you would use to help drive your compensation with your employer. Um, and I probably help PGA members with five to seven compensation surveys a week to help you determine uh, what value that position should be or when you're hiring, you can use that to really determine what you should be paying for that position as well. And then I'll finish up with uh, uh, employment, uh, what we call them employment tours or site uh, visits, those kind of things. Um, two weeks ago, I came up to the northern area, met with Rob at Sherwood to talk about the employment committee, but then got around to six other golf clubs. Two of them were non-PGA facilities. I talked to two uh, unemployed members, visited uh, with an owner of a non-PGA facility, and I think we're going to have a posting come out on that. There's a lot of value in that. There's a lot of value for us to be able to go to your facility, meet with you um, at your own home, and truly understand what it is that you're doing, how we can support you, um, as well as uh, listen to your accomplishments at your club. It amazes me how hard you are working. I mean, I was a green grass professional for 15 years. I knew how many hours I put in. But when I talk with you, especially at your facilities, uh, I realize how hard you are working. And that's the reason I started off thanking you for, for how hard it is because it gives us an opportunity to get out there and really see what you've accomplished at your club and then also help you take those accomplishments, uh, potentially increase your compensation, uh, support you in any way that we can. So anytime that you would like myself, um, Tom Addis loves to get out of the office and do that, potentially one of the officers or the board of directors come with us and we can visit you, please reach out to us and let us know that uh, that's always available to you. So uh, thank you. It's a pleasure to uh, serve you in the Southern California section. <clears throat> thank you very much, Ken. And I'd like to make an announcement that um, every two years, the board of directors selects the next officer of the section and obviously started secretary, then vice president, and president. And uh, yesterday, 
the board of directors unanimously uh, announced that Robin Shelton is going to be the next officer of the Southern California section. So congratulations to you, Robin. But uh, just so everyone knows the process, for the next six months, he'll shadow the other officers, particularly Tony Latendry, the current secretary, and then he'll start his role as secretary and get uh, sworn in at the annual meeting in December. So we're very excited about that. And Robin, congratulations. You've done an amazing job. Completely revamped our education program, and so thank you for all that. Um, on the education announcements, I wanted to mention that uh, we can, he continues to have webinars, a couple webinars a month, which are a great way, particularly if your facility is in a remote location for you to get your points and not have to travel as much. So they've been uh, amazing topics and it's gone very, very well. And so uh, I would highly recommend uh, you taking advantage of that. The other education announcement is uh, this is going to be our second year that we're in our one-on-one -on -one education program. So what we did is last year, in 2015, we started a program where if you're a teaching professional and you wanted to get some help on marketing your product, which therefore could help you make more money, we, the section, hired a marketing consultant. Basically, their job is to help you with creating your own website, social media, uh, database, etc. And uh, we had about uh, 35 people take advantage of that. It's still available to those of you that would, might want that opportunity to help boost your uh, teaching revenue. And then this year, starting uh, in 2016, we added the head professional training. It's where if you're an assistant golf professional, it's ready to take the next step to head professional. A professional wants some extra training in a certain area, you can call the section office, talking to Mr. Tom Addis, and he'll get you connected with a mentor that will come to your course, spend about uh, four to five to six hours with you, mentoring you, helping you, one-on-one -on -one education to truly help you in anywhere you'd like to help you go to the next level in your profession. So I highly recommend you take advantage of being one of those programs. It's an excellent opportunity to uh, advance your career and hopefully your revenue as well. Um, next announcement I want to make is Board of Director Candidates. Starting in December, there's going to be two uh, positions open. So those of you that might have interest in becoming, getting on the board, uh, please do so. Or if you know someone that might be interested, might be ready to take that, that leap, I highly recommend it. I can just tell you from my own personal experience, it's one of the best things I ever did. Whatever you give, you get back tenfold, I promise you. So I highly recommend you take a look at uh, doing that. Uh, next one is that so we have our town hall meeting at Industry Hills on August 25th. So that's coming up. We're very excited about that. We've got three excellent speakers, including our own uh, Vice President of the PGA, Mr. Paul Levy. So it's going to be a, a great experience for us there. And then the last announcement is, I'm sure everyone's aware, this is our 100th year. I hope so. The PGA Magazine, it's been all, been all over. And there was a centennial issue last month. But um, the annual meeting is going to be hosted in New York City, November 8th through the 12th, so you have an opportunity to go. I highly recommend it. And in celebration for that, so what we've done is we've got some cupcakes. We had a cake at the last meeting, the Gibbs, and we have cupcakes here. So when I hear from this golf course, it's very challenging. You need the energy. So we, at the end of the meeting, they'll be on your way out if you'd like a, a cupcake, a centennial cupcake for the PGA. So I uh, just want to keep everybody abreast of that. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Mr. Todd Kiefer, our Vice President. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Thanks, Mr. President. We'll keep the, uh, the notes kind of brief on our financial updates. Uh, as I think many of you know, we get supported from the national office, and through their uh, accounting software conversion, uh, we, we really don't have a lot of details. It's, uh, that program has taken a lot longer to come uh, together, but uh, so we'll be some information hopefully in the next month or so on our current uh, position after the first quarter. But I can share with you that overall, uh, the section continues to operate in, in good shape, very close to our budgeting expectations. Um, our officers uh, meet with, with Tom and with Jeff on a weekly basis on our call and kind of review our programming and review how we're performing. So while we don't have a lot of the data to share with you today, I can share with you that uh, staff has done an excellent job working through um, watching the numbers and making sure that uh, we're doing everything we're supposed to be doing. So overall, good shape. Uh, we did have an investment uh, committee meeting uh, earlier in April. Uh, I think most of you know that if you watch any of the stock markets, the, uh, the first part of the quarter uh, of 2016 was, was brutal. Uh, we, we lost about 10% of our worth in our portfolio and have been kind of working to kind of rebuild it. So we're right back about to where we started the year. It's been an interesting ride because uh, 
I was told by John when I came on board that there's no problem with the portfolio, it'll do totally fine, it'll be easy. And uh, so we kind of got a little shock to the system, but it, it, what it did is it helped uh, the committee to start taking a look at how frequently we can meet, uh, the things we need to take a look at. We did do some rebalancing of the portfolio back in February, and that really did help to kind of uh, protect uh, the, the very things that we worked so hard to, to do. We'd take 4% of that investment and put it into programmings, so it's very important we pay attention and make sure we continue to promote that, uh, that growth. The, the final note is uh, the budget uh, committee uh, got approved some updated information for the, uh, for the board. Uh, for those of you other clubs, I'm sure you're getting ready to think about budgets for uh, 2017. Well, uh, the section is as well. Kind of added a few more milestones in there so that we can have a, a, a budget ready to be approved at our December meeting. Uh, but again, it's uh, a lot of details and, and kudos to Christy and, and the team for all their effort there at the section office to really make sure that uh, the chapters have what they need and, and we're, uh, we're watching our money. So with that, I'll move on with the board. It's tougher to get a loud clap on finances. <laughs> Um, next, I'd like to introduce Tony Latendre, who is uh, the secretary of the association. Uh, but I also want to mention that he is the a apprentice chairman. And uh, at our board meeting yesterday, we spent quite a bit of time on how we can do a better job of engagement, engagement of the membership as well, particularly the apprentices. And um, Tony's got some things we're going to talk about, some talk about there. But uh, our goal is to try to get the apprentices more and more engaged, get them to these meetings earlier and recognize them. So with that, I'm going to turn over to Tony Latendre. Can you come up this time? <clears throat> okay, good, uh, good morning, everybody. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, just as an update on the apprentices, I uh, wanted to let you know that we made a change, uh, the Board of Directors made a change yesterday uh, unanimous, unanimously uh, to change the eligibility requirement, or modify the eligibility requirement just a touch for the apprentices. Uh, you may or may not be aware that new apprentices, when they uh, are enrolled in the program, they do need to attend an orientation, which is facilitated at the section office. Uh, it involves an overview of what we do as a section, as an association, and just kind of give them a kickstart to uh, what they're, what's going to happen as they embark on this journey towards PGA membership. Uh, well, one of the things that we've discussed is participation in the AAA, and our AAA has uh, really grown this year. Uh, we're excited to say that we're just about 20, 19 or 20 players short of where our numbers were last year, so that's real exciting for participation. And we want to feed off of that. So as we roll into this, we've decided to make a change that as of right now, as of yesterday at the board meeting, uh, newly registered apprentices now have a three-month grace period where they can participate in AAA events prior to them having to attend orientation. So rather than have to make an exception once in a while, which we have done on a couple of occasions to allow somebody to play in a AAA event, we're allowing the apprentices a three-month grace period to participate in events, not the AAA championship, not the AAA match play, and not the North-South Cup, but any other AAA event that they can play in, or a section event, including the pro assistant, for those first three months. At the end of that three months, they would still not be able to play in tournaments until they attend orientation. But this was an adjustment that we felt was necessary to make sure uh, that we do continue along with Mr. Uh, Mr. McNair's uh, you know, guidance that we want to have engagement and we want to continue the AAA program growing the way it is. So uh, I hope that makes a lot of people happy. I think that will uh, really be better for our section and to uh, increase the participation and continue where we're going with that. So any questions about that before I move on to the Secretary's report? Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I want you to know that, uh, as, a, as a note, it was brought to the board by the Apprentice Committee and it was supported by the Tournament Committee as well, so just so you know. Uh, in the Secretary's report, uh, currently our section is still the third, third largest section in the country. Uh, we do have 1,726 members and apprentices. We have 1,350 members and 376 uh, apprentices specifically. 
Uh, we currently have 87 suspended apprentices, which is 23% of that number. Uh, we are below the national average, which is right around 35% right now. Uh, so that's good. We'd obviously like that number to be zero. If you do have apprentices that are working under you uh, that are suspended, we encourage you to help them to get, uh, get going and get, on tra get back on track. Uh, we do have some new members. If you're in the room, I'd like you to stand and be recognized. Uh, as of this meeting, we have new members Andrew Larkin, Brian Smock, and Monta Sokolovska. If the three of you are here, I'd like you to stand and be recognized. I know uh, Andrew's here. So congratulations on your <laughs> We also have some brand new apprentices that are in the room. Uh, I'd like to specifically recognize Pick Tim Tum Tong. Peach, Tim Tim Tom, I apologize, and Efren Batista, uh, if you're here, uh, and any other apprentices that are in the room, I would really appreciate if you'd stand and be recognized. We'd like to see this number go up. The sooner you get involved, I think the more you'll get out of your membership. Uh, we do have some quarter century members that have joined the ranks. Uh, we are up to 349 quarter century members. I don't believe any of these individuals are here, but I would like to recognize if you are here, I apologize, please do stand for me. Uh, Mr. Jeff Cranford, Kenneth Doran, Chris Harold, Richard Hunter, and Brett Stewart. I'm not sure if any of them are here. I haven't seen them. <coughs> but I'd like to give them a round of applause for 25 years. Uh, we'd also like to recognize we have three new half century members. Uh, that makes 40 for our section. Uh, Ray Oaks, Dennis Callahan, and here today is Manuel Casada, who uh, would like to come forward and say a few, a few words. So, Mr. Casada, if you wouldn't mind, we'd love to have you. Here. pretty windy when I get behind a microphone. But I do owe some special thanks to some special pros that got me to where I am. The first thing I want to say about the golf business, when I was offered the job, I was getting out of school and under the GI Bill you can miss a year and go back. I said, I, I think I better give this a try. I don't know if I'd go enjoy being a school teacher with all the nasty parents that might, I might encounter. <laughs> well, after I was on the job, for just not too long, it came to me and said, this isn't a job. This is a way of life. And I've been very lucky and blessed with the pros that have helped me along the way. I may miss some of them, but I want to, you might know some of the names you may not know because I'm pretty old. Uh, Lou Gilliam. Lou Gilliam, I met when he was a Marine at the Marine base in Barstow. The reason I met him there, I grew up in a small town, grass didn't grow there. My coach, and at school at my side, when you were the coach, you coached everything football, basketball, baseball, everything. And he was unusual because he wasn't just an athlete from UCLA. In 1947, he was captain of the Rose Bowl team. He was Pacific Coast heavyweight champion. He was Mr. Five by Five. And he wanted me to go to UCLA. Well, I learned to play golf with tee up every shot. And my, and my oldest brother, Tommy, lived in Barstow, Barstow Marine Base. Anyway, I met Lou Gilliam there. Years later, Lou Gilliam working at uh, El Rancho Verde. Well, the Dutch was a pro there. And I went to visit him, <clears throat> getting, here, getting out of school, and he said, man, I'm going to, I'm going to get a golf, golf course in a few months. You want to come work for me? I said, let me give it some thought. I just have to say, after I was there two months, I was on my way. Now, the next person, pro that comes into my life is Owen Dutra. Now, I, I could play golf. I was, I was, 1959, I was captain of the UCLA golf team. But anyway, I said, that doesn't mean I can teach it. And there's Owen Dutra, just a couple of miles up the street at Arupa Hills. So I wouldn't take lessons from old Dutra, so I wouldn't goof up anybody coming up. Well, one of the smartest things I ever did. A few months later, Olin's going to leave to go to Anaheim, and he invited me to go with him. I said, I was ready yesterday. <laughs> so I, I spent five years with Olin Dutra at Anaheim. And then it was time to move on. I, I taught for a year at, at the driving range. And in that time, there wasn't just an apprentice program like it is now. And there was a lot of assistant pro. You went in because you liked to play golf. <clears throat> PGA was too big for, for the assistant to be included. 
So a bunch of young assistants, one of them Skip Witted, he's not here today, started their own home group and we had our own tournaments every month. And through Skip Witted, was, I met my greatest friend down the line, Jimmy Swaggery at Oakmont. And Jimmy Swaggery was looking for a teaching assistant, so I wound up with Jim Swaggerty. Now, from Jim Swaggerty, I still, Owen Duper still wasn't out of my life, and I'm working for Jim. He, by the way, I have to say that the greatest man I've ever known. He became my best friend, absolutely. And I'm not the only one that felt that way. When I left him, he, he financed me. Skip Whitton was another pro that he did that for, and I think he did that for a lot of systems. <coughs> but he said to me, if you can't pay me back, you have to come back to work for me. <laughs> that was the only condition of the contract. So anyhow, so I'm, I'm, I'm in the business about 10 years, and I, I made an offer that, I got an offer that enticed me to leave, and it was an offer from a man who went to East LA. There were two kinesiology professors, remember, that I went to school there, and they wanted to play open card tournament. They called me up to see if I could get them on, on the golf course. Certainly, and I'll play with you. Well, when we're done with this little game, the, the third, Third member of this group, by the way, it was a group that started that weight shift. They did it for Golf Digest. Anyhow, during the process, the other third member was named Johnny Johnson. He was going to be the he was going to be in charge of the athletic program at Northridge before it was built. He said, "Manny, I'm going to be in charge of it. Would you like to come over and be the <coughs> on my staff?" I said, but you'll have to go back to school and get, and, and, and get your master's degree. Well, I started night school, okay? However, one night I went around that freeway and I couldn't get back on it. I said, well, maybe it wasn't meant to be, and it wasn't meant to be, because two months later I was coming back from, from, from Pebble Beach and stopped to visit old Luther who had opened up Avila Golf Course. And I visited with him, and two weeks later I had a letter from him. There were two jobs open up there. And through that, I wound up at San Luis Obispo Country Club in 1971. And the nice thing when I interviewed, they, it was a small club, it was struggling. They didn't have 200 members when I was there. They said, we're very family oriented here. And you guys aren't gonna believe the next thing I say. So I said, well, I said, that's fine. I said, if you don't mind, it's kept when you have your tournaments, I like to take Sundays off for my family. I said, no problem. <laughs> and I only work Sundays when they had a tournament, and my family don't remember me working on Sunday. It, it, I know it's hard to believe that at the golf pro. Mm -hmm. Well, that, that led to other. Now, it's a struggling club, and I love being there, but I was offered Boro Bay by Al Lake. And Al Lake was there 30 years. He built the back nine. He had an unusual contract. They paid him to be there. He didn't have to give them anything for having the concession. No, nobody ever had a job like that again. They even gave him a pension, the county. They were so in trouble. So he could, he could name anybody to take his place, and fortunately he named me Moore Bay. And so that's how I went up in Moore Bay, and I was my kid's first boss. <laughs> there, there was a job for my two daughters and my son. So I knew that if whenever they got a job, they wouldn't ever get fired, because if you paid them for eight hours, they gave you eight hours work. So that's when I went up in Moore Bay, and, and, and then, they put it out to bid, and they didn't realize how bad a bid it was. And I didn't bid on the job. I said, how come you don't bid on the job? That contract was already written. You weren't bidding on the contract. You were bidding on who would make the most capital improvements. I said, with that contract, I couldn't make any. They didn't realize that everybody comes into your golf shop after pay for green fee. Then I'd spend a brown penny with you. And I can remember earlier in my career there, when I raised the coffee from 20 cents to 25 cents, because I got tired Jane, half the people came with a copy of their thermos. <laughs> That's the way it was there, and the reason Moore Bay was such a great job, not the local, the tourism. Tourism, and it's very cool in Moore Bay, and you can be in the valley at 170 degrees in Moore Bay. We sold more sweaters and jackets in the summertime than we did in the wintertime. But anyhow, that's how I wound up there, and then, then what happens? I got lucky, I overachieved, I qualified for the senior open in 84. I was the youngest pro there, and I had already met Chuck Green, but there we became very close friends. And sure enough, when, when I left Moore Bay, there's Chuck Green saying, Manny, I've been, I've been allowed to hire an assistant manager and teaching pro, would you like the job? So I wound up at, 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 the, at the Port Wainimi Golf Course for 13 years, and Chuck says, I'm gonna retire and you'll take over, and sure enough, it worked out that way. So now, I, I, I can go on forever naming all these pros, and 
and I'm going to stop now. And it just, it just confirmed what I thought when I first went into the golf business, saying it wasn't a job, it was a way of life. When I retired in 01, at, at the age of 16, all my kids told me the same thing. Dad, you never work. Thank you. about my report? Thank you very much, Mr. President. I was hoping to come up and run the rest of the meeting. Uh, with that, I'd like to bring up Mr. Tom Addis for staff reports. Tom? <laughs> something that uh, Mr. Farrell mentioned that uh, I'd like to get out of the office. I don't want to give you the wrong impression. Um, I love the office and I would like to get out of the office to visit you all. So uh, I did want to clarify that. Um, the other thing is thank you so much for being here today. This is a great spot. Uh, you all know it's a great golf course. So uh, those of you who are playing today, please enjoy uh, and uh, uh, have a great day. And we thank you for, again, for playing, and thank you for your support of the Southern California PGA, because uh, with all of you in the room, we couldn't do what we do, and, and, uh, and so we sincerely thank you for that. Uh, just a couple things. Uh, on your table, you've seen uh, a couple things dealing with the foundation. We are uh, starting a renewed effort with the Southern California PGA Foundation. Uh, as you probably know, it's uh, uh, the home base of our Junior Golf Association. Uh, but it's uh, also uh, a home base for supporting uh, player development, other initiatives, and other activities within the Southern California PGA, uh, whether it be our junior development tour and our, our new junior development clinics uh, that uh, really bridge kids from our golf and schools program, our neighborhood golf, uh, PG, even PGA Junior League, and drive, chip, and putt uh, into our programs that we have within the section. Uh, and we have nearly 2,500 members of our Junior Golf Association that continues to grow and, and, uh, and we hope that the programs that we conduct uh, will continue to be feeders into that program and then of course uh, into bringing uh, renewed business and new business to your golf facilities throughout Southern California. Uh, as a matter of fact, you probably haven't heard this for a, a while, but uh, we do a significant number of rounds. We do over 20,000 rounds a year. Uh, at PGA professional facilities uh, and the revenue, the incremental revenue that we bring to your golf course through our junior golf program is significant. So, and we thank you for hosting and we thank you for uh, allowing us to bring our events uh, to your golf facilities. Uh, but again, the foundation doesn't stop there. It's, it, it begins with providing scholarships and grants so some of these young kids can play uh, as well as providing these, these uh, golf clinics and other programs uh, that help bridge kids to uh, the golf course and to you, whether it be for golf instruction uh, or simple participation at, at your golf course. Uh, also on the table, you'll see a, a, a flyer for the foundation. Uh, we uh, are looking uh, to participate with you, whether it be in fundraising or certain activities, such as uh, the Ryder Cup drawing that you see. Uh, we've had moderate success with that. We're looking forward to a July 7th deadline for the Ryder Cup. Uh, we'd appreciate it if you have the opportunity to pass around uh, your club to see if any of your players, your members are interested. Uh, it's a Ryder Cup package for two people. It includes airfare, uh, a home at the Ryder Cup. Uh, it's a two-bedroom home uh, that's about three miles from the golf course, and, and it's a, a great opportunity uh, to use. They're $100 a ticket. Not that I'm trying to sell anything right now, but they are $100 a ticket, and we're selling a maximum of 100 So. 
there might be an opportunity there. Also, second prize uh, is two tickets to the Ryder Cup as well. You have to get there on your own, uh, but there are two more tickets. So uh, I encourage you to, to uh, take a look at that and, and, uh, uh, and possibly participate with that. Uh, the other flyer that's on the table is uh, uh, pertaining to the Las Vegas show coming up in August. I encourage you to attend. Uh, and uh, the, the Las Vegas show, for those of you who have been, and uh, a few of you attend both uh, Orlando and Las Vegas, you, you see the significant difference between the two. Uh, Las Vegas has its niche, uh, and obviously Orlando has, has a, a little larger niche in the golf business. But we encourage you uh, to take a trip to Vegas, see um, uh, the vendors, many of our sponsors. Uh, you'll hear from a couple uh, later on this morning. Many of our sponsors are at Las Vegas. Uh, and it's always good to uh, say hello to our sponsors and, and support that group uh, as much as you can. We, uh, we do very, very well with our sponsorships in the section that provide uh, great purse dollars for you and, and as well as allow us to do certain uh, education and, and junior golf programs as well. So uh, encourage you uh, in that regard. Uh, one more thing before I step down, I'd like to thank our staff, the Southern California PGA staff, for their hard work. Uh, in putting together a meeting like this, as well as uh, the programs, whether it be tournament programs, uh, member programs, education programs, uh, and the like. And uh, appreciate the effort that they do. Appreciate, again, your support uh, in helping us to provide these programs and, and to uh, continually work with us uh, for the betterment of, of the uh, uh, PGA professional in our section. So, Mr. President, thank you very much. Tom. <coughs> Committee and chapter reports uh, have been submitted and will be posted on scpga.com. And with that, I'd like to call old business. And I know, Ron O'Connor, you wanted to mention something, correct, Ron? Thank you, Mr. President. Good morning, everybody. I'm one of the six co-chair of the senior division. And it's a well-known fact that we go to the uh, about 80% of the same golf courses every year, mainly because of their support and cooperation and the good job that the head professionals do. And I've got the privilege today to recognize a uh, head professional in his club that were uh, one of the outstanding facilities this year and have a little uh, token of our appreciation for Robert Duncan from Mission Lakes Country Club. Come up, Robert. This is uh, with our greatest appreciation to Mission Lakes Country Club for their support and dedication in hosting the 2016 Senior Kickoff Classic. And that was the, what, eighth time we played there? Can't remember anymore. <laughs> <laughs> I'm catching up to you. Yeah. <laughs> I'm slowing down, make it easy for you. <laughs> Thank you, Robert, and uh, thanks for the opportunity. I just want to say one thing that I... Uh, Recommend to anybody head golf professional at your golf course, open it up to tournaments for the PGA, help them out, get different golf courses, and just utilize the uh, opportunity you have for people to come play your golf course. It can only help out. Thanks. Thank you, gentlemen. First call for old business. Second call for old business. Moving into new business. Is there any new business? First call for new business. Second call for new business. Now we'll move into the members open forum. Would anyone like to 
get up and speak or present something like to discuss. The uh, Disabled Golf Committee, we're going to Pendleton next week. We have a little short of instructors for that, so see me if you want to. Uh, we're going to Camp Pendleton for a Wounded Warrior Clinic next Wednesday. We're trying something new also on July 24th, which is a Sunday. We're going to do a big inner city junior golf festival at Chester Washington Golf Course. It'll be 12 to 2. We're going to pick up like 45 kids on that day, so I need some rock star instructors to come down and uh, try to instill some values in the kids that, you know, the whole deal. So that's July 24th. I could use some uh, instructors for that. Uh, June 27th will be a Navy for a regular disabled vet clinic. Uh, and then August 1st is our 17th annual golf clinic for the junior blind. I know a lot of you have helped in that, and it's very cool. That's one that if you have a kid of your own that you want to teach gratitude to, bring them to that event, and they're welcome to help out. That's an amazing event, and that's uh, on August 1st at the Navy Golf Course. So, Or if you got an apprentice you want to have teach a little gratitude to. All right, thanks, guys. <laughs> Thank you, Joe. I'm sure you do uh, great work there for children, disabled, and veterans. So thank you so much for all you do. Uh, one more call for members open forum. Anyone else like to speak? Okay. With that, I'd like to uh, once again thank Tom, Jeff, and the entire staff for all you do, the countless hours, uh, the number of events we put on, all the good work we do with player development. It's uh, truly a labor of love, but thank you for all, all that you do. Um, with that, I'd like to talk about, uh, bring up Nicole to go through the sponsor's presentations. Nicole. Professional Development Education Program and through the Junior Golf Tour. So, thank you so much for having us, and I look forward to many more years to come. Thank you. All right, our next item that we're going to be raffling off is some wonderful grips that Brett Pride has given us. Um, Seven zero one zero five seven. Seven zero one zero five seven. All the way in the back. All right. I'm just gonna check that. All right. If you guys haven't visited our wonderful other partners in the back, we've got Global Tour. Huh? Global Tour Golf. And we got Golf. Buddy, in, all the way in the back, wave at us. Perfect, Doug. And Karen, all the way in the back, perfect. And I know Jim's all the way in the corner, you can't see him. Wait, what's that mountain? 
Oh, there he is. He's waving at us. Perfect. He moved so he can see us. Nice. All right, and our next one that we're going to be raffling off from Jim is his wonderful bag right here that you can see. 70168. And then our wonderful partners over here from Cleveland are going to come up and speak. And then we'll off, we'll walk, we'll raffle off a customized wedge from them. Good morning, everybody. <laughs> this is great. This feels like coming home. <laughs> it's amazing being gone for a couple of years and coming back. Same, yeah, Loma, I see you. <laughs> Same cast of characters, but better looking now. You guys are all awesome. Uh, let's see, what am I going to cover? I got, what, 30 minutes, huh, Tom? <laughs> <laughs> Tom asked, it's great. He said, out of all the Chinese tournament directors and sections it's ever had, and I was the best one. <laughs> Thank you, Tom. <laughs> Oh boy, this is good. Uh, this is a journey, you know. I'm, you know, what am I going to say to you guys? You guys know everything. You're the experts of the industry. It's just been a great journey for me to come out there and see uh, all of my friends, customers, Metro chapter mostly LA, and I go up to Paso Robles. Uh, you know, David Myrtle, he handles Inland Empire and in Palm Springs area. Um, so. This uh, veteran of the group, he's actually new to the Orange County area, but when has been with uh, Street Sign in Cleveland for about three years, one of our top sales reps in the nation, Eddie Seafelt. So those who are in the Orange County area, you guys are real lucky to have this guy. He'll say a couple words in a second here. But uh, no, we appreciate all your support. You know, Street Sign Cleveland, Zexio, that XXIO that you see uh, in me playing and growing out there in the metropolitan area as far as presence at golf courses the high end. It's really a healthy company uh, looking forward to providing a new wedge this fall. We have a lot of exciting um, products coming your way that we'll be able to show you uh, along our fall run. Um, so uh, we look forward to it. I look forward to uh, uh, seeing you guys soon. Uh, is Mike Mitchell here by any chance? Mike? Okay, so for the tournament director's report, you don't need to cover pace of play, payouts, or uh, <laughs> anything else that pertains to tournaments. So means the journey to go play golf. Guys, <laughs> okay, I don't know many faces in here yet. Uh, I'm Eddie Seafelt. Uh, I was a rep over in Northern California, uh, Sacramento area. So we, we did a lot of support with the, the NorCal section up there as well. Um, I don't, like I said, I'm just getting into the Orange County. I'm gonna be the rep for Orange County now. I'm going to see everybody. I'll meet everybody uh, as, as fast as I possibly can. My whole goal is for you guys not to call me your rep, but just to call me your friend. You know, and that's, that's kind of how I do business. I'm here to support you. I'm here to <coughs> try to be as, uh, as friendly as Gerald, and I won't put you on the clock by any means if I see you at a tournament. But uh, my whole goal is to, is to just to be your friend. And you know, this, this fall, week, it's very exciting. We a great tournament last, this weekend at the Memorial. Two guys, two strikes on guys in the playoff. Both were fighting for their first PGA win, and Will McGirt definitely uh, he pulled it out. Pulled it out very well. But very exciting times. We got a lot of new product coming out. I don't want to be a big sales pitch up here, but a lot of new product coming out in the fall with some great technology stories and something that will, will help grow the game and be there. For you. But we're going to be there for support for your for your members and yourself. And but whatever I can do, and whatever Gerald can do, or David can do, just let us know. And but we're here for we're here for all of you. Right here. Perfect. All right. 
All right. And then do we have Joe Martin real quick from EasyGo? Yep. Wonderful. Good morning. A lot of familiar faces that uh, have been around for a few years, like myself, 17 years now with EasyGo. I'd like to uh, introduce Mike Cross, who's handling the San Diego, Riverside, Palm Springs territory for EasyGo now. Mike joined us about a month and a half ago, and I'm excited to have him as, uh, as part of our team. Steve Monteith, uh, our regional director, couldn't be here today, so you're stuck with me. Um, Tom asked that Tom Addis asked if I do my entire interpretation or my entire presentation in interpretive dance, but I don't have my bike shorts. So, um, on behalf of all the employees of EasyGo, all 1,000 or so of us, thank you very much for your support of EasyGo uh, in the past, in the present, in the future. We've got a lot of really, really great new products coming out. Some of you I know have seen our new 72 volt uh, electric hauler. Um, people that have driven it and used it have all said the same thing. It's an amazing vehicle. Uh, we've got new golf product coming out uh, at the first of the year that I think is going to set the industry on its, let's say, year. Um, and I'm, I'll be excited to, to show that to everyone here. Thanks to, to Todd and, and John, Tony, Tom, Jeff Johnson for your support over the years. Uh, we look forward to being a part of the PGA going forward uh, for many years to come. Thank you and have a great afternoon. Well, our partners are just so great, they don't want us to stop raffling things off. So Doug has generously given you guys a uh, Wazer GPS rangefinder. Um, so let's do one more. 701053. Five three. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Gene Schuler. All right. <laughs> Thank you. Perfect. Thanks to all of our partners. We really do appreciate you guys. It's not just about the wonderful products that they give us and whatnot, but they do generously give in the amounts to your tournament purses that you're playing for today and on a lot of the tournaments over the course of the year. So if you guys do see them in the back, please, please, please make sure that you um, shake their hands and say thank you because they are the ones that um, help with these meetings and your tournaments over the course of the year. So without them, we can't do what we do today. So thank you. Thank you, Nicole, and thank you to all the sponsors for today's event. At uh, this time, I'd like to bring up Mr. Robert Shelton to introduce Dr. Joe Parent, who's going to speak to us and motivate us. So, Robert, if you please come up. Thank you for the opportunity here. Uh, one of the things we are trying to do is looking at our uh, our meetings and our general meetings. Uh, is trying to identify ways to uh, make sure that everybody walks out of here better, uh, make sure that everybody walks out of here smarter, uh, and has more of an impact for, from being here. So you can probably tell we've done our reports; have gotten much shorter. Um, we're really trying to kind of expand our knowledge base. So uh, today, I think we're very fortunate. We've got Dr. Joe Parent who's going to be here um, speaking with us. And if you don't know much about um, Dr. Dr. Joe, he's a keynote speaker, best-selling author, uh, and instructor on the PGA Tour. He's written uh, multiple books, and his really focus is on is on mastering the mental game. Um, so he looks at hey, mastering the mental game both in golf and business uh, and in life. And he is a coach on the PJ Tour. Uh, he is the, the only one that we know of that is uh, coached mentally. Uh, no, number one female player in the world uh, and a number one male player uh, in the world. So super talented and recognized by Golf Digest uh, as one of the top ten mental coaches um, on the planet. So he's been featured uh, ESPN, HBO, CNBC. Um, 
So like I say, numerous boats have been a keynote speaker for Bank of America, Merrill Lynch, uh, the Tiger Woods Foundation, AIG, I mean, if you, you name it, he's, he's been there. Um, he's probably, in our world, what he's best known for um, is often the book Zen Golf. Um, so that's probably where, you, where you've seen his name. Um, he's also had a, a new book out um, called The Best Diet Book. Some of us can probably even use this even more. Uh, it's called The Best Diet Book, The Zen uh, of Losing Weight. So um, Dr. Joe actually does teach here in Southern California, so he's out of Ohio uh, Valley and, and the Los, Los Angeles Country Club. So I think we're very fortunate to have a, the gentleman here is talented um, and is knowledgeable. Um, and today he's talking about hey, uh, becoming great um, in golf and business and in life. So you'll see some, some extending beyond just golf uh, so you can improve in your life and your relationships. So with that, Dr. Joe, thank you for being here. I didn't know this room was here, that's pretty good. Got a couple of extra a little overflow, right? Great. Thank you, Robin. Appreciate that very much. Set my water where I won't be up to go. Ah, there we go. Can you hear me okay? No. How about now? Is that <coughs> That's great. Is that all right? That's great. Okay. Well, good morning. Thank you for having me here. Really appreciate it. Uh, Santa Clara Country Club. Love this place. And uh, not too far from uh, my, my two bases, which are the Ojai Valley Inn and the Los Angeles Country Club. Lots of familiar faces, a lot of new faces. It's great to be here. Um, looks like a beautiful day, and I know you're going to enjoy the golf, so I won't keep it too long. Um, what I'd like to talk about today, I wanted to thank Robin and uh, also Eric Evans, who invited me uh, as part of the education committee. But what Eric talked to me about was he, he said, you know, don't just talk about your approach to golf, but also about how we can use the mental game principles to teach in making our work and our lives better. So I'd like to be able to do a little bit of that. Uh, an outline has been handed out. I'm going to cover, it's, uh, it's about three days worth of topics, but I'm, gonna, I'm just going to touch on them, and then I want to leave plenty of time for people to ask questions, and we can talk about those. <clears throat> um, let's start out with, what does mental game coaching mean? Okay. What I do is I help people like you, golfers, and people in business, people in their lives, get out of their own way to get the most out of their abilities. So if we just take a look at golf, um, let's take a look at what the relationship with the mental game and the swing is. You know, I, uh, you, I ask a lot of people, and I'll ask you guys, what percentage of the game do you think is mental? What would you say? 80, I hear an 80. Anybody else? 95. Do I hear, oh, a 95. Do I hear 96? 96. 95 going once. Any more than 95? 100. 100. 100%. Okay, well, I, I like to say it's 90% mental and 10% mental. So I, I agree with Rob. And that's because your mind runs every swing that you make. Uh, and But it's not just your mind because you can't just think the ball down the fairway, you have to have some technique. So it's the relationship between the two. You know, I had a couple of students who had a mistaken idea about that and they wanted to go just go out and practice the mental game. So they went out without any clubs or balls. And they got on the you know, they got on the first tee and one of them stood up and said, uh, okay, I think I got this. 280 right down the middle. <laughs> The other guy said, not bad, uh, I'll give it a go. 290 right down the middle. Oh, pretty good. And they hit fairways and greens and made birdies and eagles all the way around the course. And they found themselves tied in the middle of the 18th fairway. And one of them said, I think, uh, I think I'm away. I've got about 180, that's a smooth eight iron for me. So I'll, I'll just, uh, oh, it's tracking, it's in the hole. The other guy said, you lose. He said, what do you mean? He said, you hit my ball. <laughs> so, so it's not just a mental game. It's the relationship between the body and the mind. And that's the key to the mental game, how you can use your mind to run your body the best you can. Um, 
the relationship with swing instruction is I can help you with you if you take your dispersion pattern. In other words, ideal conditions, you make your best swings, you hit 10 balls, they're not all going to land in the exact same spot. Even Iron Byron, the robot, the balls don't all land in the exact same spot. And we're not robots, so we all have a dispersion pattern. And the size of your dispersion pattern will be in relation to your skills, your physical your technique and your physical skills. So uh, just like a, uh, an experienced or master dart, dart thrower would hit a couple of bullseyes and the rest would all be grouped right around it. That's a tight dispersion pattern and an average would be, you know, a bull could still hit a bullseye and the rest uh, around the board. And a beginner might hit a bullseye, but also the floor and the wall, and, you know, <laughs> all over the place. So, so the size of our dispersion pattern, what I can do as a mental game coach, I can help you hit all your shots within your dispersion pattern. Now, if you want a smaller dispersion pattern, or you want it to be farther away from you, in other words, hit it farther, that's where the technical skill comes in. So really what the mental game is about is getting the most out of your abilities. I remember when, uh, when Tiger was at his peak, people would talk about, well, you know, how does he compare to the other players? And what I said was, it's not that his skills are that much better than everybody else, but he, his mental, game doesn't take away from those skills. You don't add to your skills to the mental game, but you get the most out of them. And that's really the difference. So, so every other player had to play at, at their best because their mental game wasn't as sharp. And what happened when he went through the, the uh, trials and tribulations that he did, it was more his mental game that held him back from reaching the peaks that he, that he had before. That's my feeling. I haven't spoken to him personally. But, but that's what the mental game is about. So how do you get out of your way, own way, and get the most out of your abilities? What I present in Zen Golf is the PAR approach. And that is preparation, action, and response to results. Preparation. Do you have a clear picture of where you want to go? And where you do want to go, a positive picture. Because um, the language of golf is, is so detrimental to our performance. If you, uh, <laughs> what's the job of a golf announcer on TV? What do you think their job is? That's right, it's entertainment. A lot of people would say it's to describe the action. There's not that much action. <laughs> but it's to entertain. And what's more entertaining? Saying, well, I think he's going to uh, try to aim this at the left center of the fairway. As opposed to, now, if he goes too far left, he's going to be blocked out. But if he goes too far right, it's out of bounds. So he's going to want to play left. But if he doesn't carry it far enough, he's not going to be able to get around the corner. He's only got a one-shot lead. This is trouble. Now that's exciting. That's the entertainment. So they're always looking for what could go wrong. And that ends up being the culture of golf. What do we talk about? Um, how would you describe it if you say, well, I don't want to go right at the, uh, the flagstick. Where do I want to miss it? You don't want to miss it. <laughs> I don't believe in something called the, well, there, there's, there is something called the good miss. And that's when you top the ball, but it rolls all the way onto the green. Yeah, that's a good miss. But if, if you hit it anywhere in your area, it's either a, a great shot or a good shot, or one of those. So if it's a miss, it's not good. If it's good, it's not a miss. Uh, I had a, a and, and this is about satisfaction and enjoyment of the game. I had a player who was very, very frustrated, and he was a good player. I said, what's a, what's a really good drive for you? And he said, 280 right down the middle. And I said, OK, that's great. And what's an acceptable drive? And he said, well, 260. 10 yards off the middle. I said, you're not very happy very often, are you? He said, what if it were anything over 240 and you can get your club on it cleanly and there's nothing directly in the way between you and the hole? He said, well, then I'd be happy a lot more often. I said, well, then change your definition of a good drive and you'll be happy more often. It's the attitude that you bring to it and, what's it, and, and acceptance. So 
Clarity is the first thing, a clear picture of where you do want to go rather than what you're trying to avoid. The second part of preparation is commitment. What happens if you're overshot? I call these the anyways. You're overshot and you're, you're not quite comfortable. You're not sure you're aiming correctly or the ball's teed up a little too high or a little too low. Maybe you feel like you're standing a little too far from it or it's a little too forward or back in your stance. And you get up there and you think, well, I'll just go ahead and swing anyway. How did those turn out? Well, those are the anyways. That means you're not really fully committed. And commitment means being able to handle wherever the shot ends up. So giving yourself room to play is a huge key. Um, working with Christy Kerr, I helped her get to number one in the world with one main instruction, and that is in golf you aim at a spot, but you play to an area. And once she started understanding that and seeing her areas and plotting her way around the course, it took a lot of pressure off. If you, have to, if you say, well, I have to land on my spot, that would be like saying, well, here's a quarter, and I have to toss it, I have to toss it towards that table, and if I don't land in the glass, it's a bad throw. As opposed to, if I aim at the glass, but anywhere on the table is good, I'm going to relax and just toss it. It gives you so much more relaxation, so much more freedom to swing. So commitment is about not holding back and the freedom to actually make your swing without any interference. If you... Uh, if you're aiming at a, at a green, it's a front pin, and there's water in front, do you take the longer club or the shorter one, if you're between clubs? Well, you take the longer one, of course. And then, if you're looking at the pin, just as you get up there, about here, you, you, on the way down, you think, uh-oh, too much club. <laughs> and you didn't, if you didn't really commit to it, you desell and hit a bad shot. So the next time you take a short, the shorter club, halfway down, you go, uh-oh, not enough club, and you gun it and you hit another bad shot. What you need to do is accept the possibilities and say, okay, uh, if I have a front pin, I'm going to take the longer club, but I'm, going to be, I'm not going to look at the pin, I'm going to look at the back of the green and accept that. So I had one player said, and said, yeah, but if I'm 30 feet away, what about my chances for birdie? Well, I said, 30 foot putt is a lot easier than from the bottom of the lake. So you, you take your choices and you make your commitment. The third part is composure. And you see players now, when, when Zen Golf came out 15 years ago, people weren't taking the deep breath that they do now. It's really become very much part of the game. But that's a lot of what I present in Zen Golf is using your breathing to slow you down and calm you down. When you're under stress, your energy, physiologically, your energy moves up in your body and faster. So you're up here, and your mind's racing, and uh, for you excellent golfers, do you want your swing to start from the top down or the bottom up, from the ground up? Wow. From the ground up, that's right. But if you're all stressed, you're up here, and that's why those swings that look like you're not really grounded come out. So one of my sayings, and what I want my players to do is, you know, when they stand behind the ball, uh, before they walk into a dress, take a full breath, Breathe it down, connect with the ground. Now, this practice of working with the breath and calming ourselves down is something I do in my stress management clinics for corporations as well. And uh, the new book, I think I, I, when I told people about this, uh, they were more interested in my diet book than my golf book. But. Um, <laughs> Uh, after the talk, I'm, I'm going to be back there and we'll, we'll talk about how you can get, get either one of them. But the whole principle of everything that we do in our lives, we want to be in the present moment. You know, uh, you had raffle tickets, right? Do you know what it says? I think, I don't know if it says on these, but a lot of them it says you must be present to win. Right? Well, that means more than just a raffle ticket. You, whatever you're doing, you must be present to win. So if you're thinking about the, the bad hole you just had, you're not going to be present on this hole. If you're thinking about a difficult hole or one that you think you're going to birdie up ahead, you're not on the hole that you're playing. You must be present to win. So understanding that in the tradition that, that, uh, of mindfulness that I teach, the breath is always present. It's something that we can always connect with. It's part of our environment that comes 
becomes part of us, and then it becomes part of our environment. The breath is an indicator of our stress level as well. If we're, if we're afraid of something, what do we do? We hold our breath. If we're relaxed, <sighs> breath goes out. So it's really something that's very important to work with. And on the course, I know, I was just talking with somebody about Tom Watson, and he said when he started winning, it was when he was able to start to control his energy level through his breathing. So great champions know how to do this instinctively. I want to give you a direct experience of this. So I'd like everybody to sit up as if you were paying attention. That's good. Just kind of sit up in your chair. That's great. Okay. I want you to take as good a posture as you can because when you're slumped over, you don't breathe too well. But sit up, and what I want you, you can leave your eyes open. What I want you to do is, I want you to take a full breath in, slowly let it out, all the way out. We'll do it together. And when it's and, and after it's out, just leave it out for a second and then let it come in again. So we'll, we'll, we'll do it together. I'm gonna to move my hand, don't move your hands. I'm gonna move my hand so you know, this is in, this is out, and that's all the way out. Okay, and I'll, I'll do it to the microphone so you can hear. Okay, breathe in. Slowly out. Leave it out. And let it come in naturally. Let's do it one more time. Breathe in. Nice full breath. And leave it out. And let it come in naturally. Notice how quiet it got. So when the breath was all the way out, was your mind real chatty or was it quiet? I can hear it, it was quiet. <laughs> and was your body uptight or relaxed when the breath went all the way out? Relaxed. So how about a settled, relaxed body and a quiet mind? Is that good preparation for a golf shot? It's good preparation for a golf shot. It's good preparation before you pick up a phone to, for a big phone call. It's good preparation before you go into a meeting. It's what I did before I went into this talk. You breathe and let it all the way out. Breathe it down, connect with the ground. And there's your composure. And we work with this on a regular basis. And if you do this for five minutes, you'll find your mind moving to a different place, not so caught up in your thoughts, more in the present moment, aware of your thoughts, but not caught up by your thoughts. Now, that's the preparation part. The action part, I kind of addressed when we were talking about commitment. Action means moving with your awareness in the present moment, free from doubt, free from fear, in balance, connected with your target, and not holding back. I don't like to say making an aggressive swing, but I do talk about not holding back. And that, you know, I, I hardly ever use the word don't because we say don't hit it in the lake and then all we're thinking about is the lake. But this, in this case, one of the instructions I give myself when I'm playing is, okay, don't hold back. Because fear is the greatest source of interference. And what is it fear about? Fear about the outcome. <laughs> and in our golf and in our lives, the only things holding us back are fear about the outcome. Worrying about the results is what causes the interference. If we know that we have the confidence to handle whatever we come across, success or failure, then we won't hold back, we'll give it our best shot, and then everything will be a success. Now, I talked a little bit about managing stress. One of the aspects is control. If we have the idea that we can control everything, we end up hitting our head against the, uh, it's like hitting our head against the brick wall sometimes, because we can't control everything. One of the most important things I teach about putting is to understand what you can control and what you can't control. So what is, what is a golfer's job in putting? What's your job when you set up over a putt? Now, some people say get it in the hole, but I don't believe that's the job. 
I think that's the ball's job. Your, ball, your job is to get the ball started rolling. You're not allowed to make sure it goes in the hole. You're, you, can't, you can't shovel it along the ground until it goes in. You can't pick it up and put it in the hole. You can get it started rolling. When you are trying to hold it, sometimes that interference interferes with you giving it a good start. So um, my last golf book was How to Make Every Putt. And that's changing the definition between making and holding. The ball going in the hole is making a putt. If you got it started the way you wanted, in the, on the line you wanted, at the pace you wanted, with a good roll, you made your putt. And then you see what happens. If it doesn't do what you thought it would, you learn from it, you get better at green reading. But your confidence is based on execution, not outcome. Because part of outcome are factors that you can't control. And this goes to the, uh, the common um, saying in the, I think it's in the 12-step program they use this a lot, the serenity prayer, is that right? Yeah. This, this is from the uh, 19th century, a gentleman named Reinhold Niebuhr, I think from Austria, who, it's part of a longer poem, really, but it's a, a prayer asking to be able to change or control the things we can, to accept to have the serenity to accept what we can and the wisdom to know the difference between the two. So if we focus on that and, and be able to discriminate what can I control and what, I, what can't I control, and focus on what you can and accept what you can, life is much easier and, and it minimizes the stress. Because the stress comes from worry about the outcome. Now that doesn't mean you don't care about the outcome. The word care, and I, I have a chapter in uh, Zen Golf, to care or to worry. And um, the definition of, there are two definitions of to care. One is to take an interest in, and the other is to worry about. Now we all take an interest in success, but if we worry about success, it's a big, it's, there's a big difference. And I, I was working with a, an instructor and I said, let me, let me give you the experience and his, his name was Dave, and I said, I'm gonna say two sentences, and you tell me which one makes you feel better. Dave, I care about you. Dave, I worry about you. <laughs> so if we're worried about ourselves, we're not gonna have as good an experience as if we care about ourselves, treat ourselves right, and focus on what we can control for success. Um, another aspect is complaint. Uh, uh, I have a Zen story that I'll, I'll tell you. Um, oh, what's our time, Robin? I, I don't want to go on. I get so excited about this, I just want to keep talking about it. Sorry. Okay. okay. So, there was a king, a young, young prince in ancient India, and uh, he, had a very, he was very delicate, and he liked walking around the kingdom, but all the roads were rough and rocky, and it hurt his feet. So he had this idea. He was going to have all the roads covered with leather. So he called in a contract, some contractors, and he said, okay, so what is it going to cost to cover all the roads with leather? And one said, I can do it, but it's going to take everything you have in the, king's, in the kingdom's treasury. He said, well, that, that's not so good. And another one said, well, I, can, I think I can use thin, not such thick leather, and it'll only take half of what's in the treasury. He said, that's still a lot. And then his old advisor walked up and said, your majesty, I think I can do it for you for 10 rupees. He said, what do you mean? He said, I'll just strap a piece of leather onto each of your feet and you'll be walking on leather wherever you go. <laughs> and supposedly that's how sandals were invented. But instead of trying to make the world match what we want, which will always be frustrating, we can adjust ourselves to our world. And complaint is, is stressful, and diminishes our own energy. So my teacher had a great saying about complaint. He said, don't complain about anything, even to yourself. Because complaint means you don't like how things are, but you're not gonna do something about it. And if you can do something about it, then there's no need to worry. And if you can't do something about it, there's no point to worry. <coughs> I talked about composure and, and using the, the breathing. So if you're in a stressful situation at work, now we know, we talked about it on the golf course, if you're in a stressful situation at work, 
take a time out. Take a few breaths, compose yourself, and be ready to enter into the discussion. But it helps to take time out. Now, the next topic is, is uh, making relationships work. And the two things I have here are honesty and integrity. Well, the, these are the, the core of good relationships. And honesty is that your words match the situation. Integrity is that your actions match your words. If you have both of those, there's no problem. And uh, as Mark Twain said, if you never lie, you never have to remember anything. So honesty and integrity. Now, I came up with these four kinds of yes and no, that's the next topic here, as an expression of integrity, okay. and on honesty and integrity. The words yes and no can be combined in four different ways. Yes, yes, no, no, no and yes, yes and no, right? That's the four combinations. Okay. So if you say, yes, I will do something, and then later on you fulfill that promise, and yes, you do it, how's that? Is that good? That's good. If you say, no, that's not in my range of capabilities, so I won't be able to do that, is that a problem? Not a problem, because you're not creating false expectations. If you say, no, that's not in my range of capabilities, but later on, you're able to do it, and if they still need you to, you can fulfill that. That's no yes. That's pretty good, right? What's the only problem? A yes, no, that's right. And you can use that language. It's very helpful to understand. Yes, I'll do that. Oh, no, I didn't. That's the only problem. If you, if you want to have good relationships in work, at home, in anything that you do, in your friendships, avoid, minimize the number of yes, no's that you do. And everything will be fine. Pretty simple, right? That's it. That's going to be one of uh, my next books, but it's going to be a very short one. <laughs> That's really all you need to understand. Now, there are things that happen in between when you say, yes, I'll do it, and when you actually need to fulfill that obligation that may prevent you from doing so. If that's the case, your job is to recognize the yes, no, and then, and then change it into one of the other three. Either say, well, um, I can't do what you said. Can we change our parameters, change the deadline, or change what your needs are so that, yes, I can fulfill what you need me to do? Or just say, things changed. I'm very sorry. It's now a no, no, um, and I can't do it. But I wanted to let you know as soon as I could. That's the best thing that you can do. Leaving it until the deadline and then saying, if it was a yes, no, that's when you get in trouble. Okay? Now, what I teach is uh, called the path of continuous improvement. And the PAR approach is very essential to that. Preparation, action, response to results. How you respond to results. When you hit a good shot, I want you to reinforce that with excitement and, and say, that's how I always hit it when I get out of my own way. And that will keep reinforcing and wanting you to hit it that way and wanting you to prepare the same way again. So if you have good preparation, good action, and a good result, that will encourage you to have more of that good preparation. If you don't, if something got in the way, instead of beating yourself up, recognize, you know what, I didn't prepare well and I wasn't committed in my action. And so next time, I know what I need to do to prepare better, and you will continuously improve that way. And, and in life, it's very simple. Taking inventory and understanding what you're trying to accomplish, what your goals are, and how you're doing, check in once in a while so that you don't get caught trying to do the same thing over and over again. And, and uh, I think this is attributed to Einstein. I don't know if it really is, but he had a definition for insanity. People know what that is? Yeah. yeah, trying to get do the same thing over and over again and get a different result. So you need to change. How do you change? 
four questions. These are from uh, something called Choice Theory by William Glasser. And that is, what do I want to accomplish? Be really clear, what do I want to accomplish? And don't give yourself a yes, no. Don't set yourself up for a yes, no. Don't try to accomplish more than you really can. What do I want to accomplish? Two, what have I been doing to get that? Now, three is the real kicker. How's that working for you? You have to say, how well is that working? And number four is, to the extent that it's not working, what could I do differently? And then start to make changes. And what I present in Zen Golf and, uh, and also in, in the diet book, because this is what we, this is what we, our life and our wellness are, is, is even more important than our golf. And that's why I wrote this, because it's more about life. And that is, what, do I, what am I trying to accomplish with my life and my health? And if it's not getting me what I want, what could I do differently? And you need, a, you need a tool to make change. And the tool that I have is called the ninja method. You know what a ninja is? It's those black clad figures that sneak in and, and, and uh, and uh, win battles, okay? So the ninja method, the words ninja, N-I-N-J-A, stand for necessary intention and non-judgmental awareness. You have to have a strong intention to accomplish your goals. If you, if you want to get better at golf, you have, a strong, you have to have a strong intention to work at it. If you want to lose weight, you have to have a strong intention and really want to. Um, psychologists have a, uh, um, a little riddle how many psychologists does it take to change a light bulb? Only one, but the light bulb has to want to change. <laughs> okay, so, but it's true, we, we have to want to change. If you don't want to change, you're not gonna put in the work, you're not gonna have the discipline. So that's the necessary intention. The second part is non-judgmental awareness. You have to be aware of what you're doing. But if you beat yourself up, it's not going to help. If you have a, a habit you want to change, and you beat yourself up every time you do it, you actually reinforce that habit because you're paying attention to it. So instead, you simply notice, non-judgmentally, how many times you do that habit, and by noticing and letting it go, it will start to diminish. I had a, a player, he was, the, he was a, a pro at Buena, I think, a long time ago, Russ Clark. Anybody know him? Well, uh, that he, he came to me um, and he said, it was very sweet, he said, my friends don't want to play golf with me anymore unless I come and talk to you. They won't play with me. I said, what's going on? He said, I whine. I complain about everything, every shot. I find something wrong with it. Even if I miss a putt, I said, did you feel that earthquake? You know, and I find something to complain about on every shot. I said, he said, I'm trying to stop, but I can't. So this is what I, I asked him to do. I said, I just want you to write the word, I think he wrote whining, but you can write complaining on your scorecard. And I just want you to count them. Don't judge yourself. Don't try to stop. Just notice each time you do it. And he called me after his first round. He shot 72, and he had 60 complaints. Six. I think the other 12 were tappings. So he said, that's terrible. I said, no, no, don't judge it. Just count. He said, got it, got it. The next round, 27. The third round, he had seven. And the fourth round, zero. He was able to play around without complaining once, which was really pleasant for his playing partners. And he had a better time. Now, I didn't tell them what to replace those complaints with, but this is the message that I want to leave you with. We, our nature is not negative, our nature is positive. We get in our own way. If we get out of our own way, positive things happen, good things happen. Our goodness, our good qualities come out. Because what he said was, you know, before, uh, if I hit it in the woods, I would have said, oh, I'm dead, and complain about it, and, and really, make a mess of the whole. But this time, this round, I said, you know, that's where I am, but if I punch out through that opening, I'll be exactly at my nine iron distance from the, from the hole, 
and I get a chance to get up and down. Wow, that's a whole big difference that I'm dead. So it changes not just, it doesn't just remove the negative habit, but it invites all of the positive habits that you have waiting to come out to be there for you. And whether it's in your golf or your business or your life, you can reduce the number of yes, no's that you do. You can change things that you do physically. Um, one of the things I did for the diet book was I stopped taking seconds. Right there. That immediately reduced calories. I started losing weight. And that's pretty simple. But you have to want to change. And, and, and I just noticed each time that I did it unconsciously, and I caught myself. And soon, it didn't happen at all. So you can change habits in your body. You can change habits in your speech. You can change habits in the way that you think. And um, Robin asked me before I came on what I was, one of the, what I was proudest about of my work. And there's one thing that happened. I got I got this uh, email quite a while ago. It was a fellow who was a uh, champion golfer in his state and had uh, back problems and had several back surgeries and got very depressed uh, and feeling sorry for himself. And he, he said he got Zen Golf and he read it and understood there was a different way to think about things. And he said he, he got on the phone and called a couple of people who he knew were having similar troubles and encouraged them. And he wrote and he said, thank you for um, changing the way I look at my situation and the way I look at my life. And I get teary. I cried when I read it and I get teary every time I see it. So um, I want to help you be better golfers. I want to help you be better business people. But what's most important to me is to help you be better people and happier and, uh, and more successful in your health and your well-being in your lives. So thank you very much. Yes, sir. You mentioned um, a couple things. One, in particular, you know, we obviously, and we we have the same discussions with our students when they're thinking, don't hit, don't hit it in the water, or don't hit it out of bounds. You right. know, the brain actually doesn't hear the do not; it hears the out of bounds or the water. That's right out of the chapter. Don't hit it in the lake. Right, but at the same time, you're telling yourself, don't hold back, which is also a I know, isn't that interesting? That's that's the only don't that I, I use. He was, can you hear all the way back there? He was saying, yes, yeah, don't hit it in the lake, don't hit it in the water. We don't, we, we, we'd rather not have those. Um, as far as, let, let's take the two parts. The lake and the water, uh, what I use is um, the rather method. Uh, instead of saying, don't hit it over there, say, I'd rather, if the lake's on the right, I'd say, I'd rather be in the left center of the fairway. <clears throat> if the pin's way in the back, I'd rather be under the hole, rather than don't hit it long. Those, those kinds of things. So couching it in positive terms. The don't hold back, um, that is the one exception. And it, it has to do with uh, the message that we give ourselves about how we move our bodies. And you could say, let it go. That's a positive way to go. And a lot of people like that better. It's what, you know, I, I don't want to prescribe any particular language. It's important for you to find what works for you. And so, uh, let it go. I had one player say, let it fly. Um, I actually use one where I want to get my thinking mind out of it and not give my instructions. One of the chapters in Zen Golf is during your swing is not the time to give yourself a lesson. <clears throat> and I actually have my thinking mind tell my body, I just say, take over. And I become the observer and let my body be the actor. Instead of being the director, I'm the observer. So uh, I think that's a really good point. You don't have to use the word don't hold back. Don't, don't hold back. Uh, to me, it's, it's, kind of, it's kind of saying the same thing as let it go. But thank, thank you for bringing that up. We, it's, it's better to avoid the word don't. So I agree with you there. 
So let, let's use free it up. How's that? You like that one? Yes. Free it up. That's good. Whatever works for you, that's what's important about this. Next question. Robin, you have, did you have one? Oh, I mean, I, got, I keep here all afternoon. No. Um, what do you think is the biggest difference between, you know, mental game, you know, from people like us in this room versus the VJ's thing and the Christy Kerr's of the world? Uh, difference in mental game between uh, very good players and, um, <clears throat> and top players on the PGA and LPGA tour? Yeah. And then how do they get there? And, and how do they get there? Uh, I think you. Um, I think the mental game issues are very, very much the same. And uh, in, I, I think one of the big differences there is, and and I know in, in working with them, this is their uh, how well they play is their livelihood, their career, everything. And um, you can go to a dark place pretty fast mentally. Uh, I had one player. He was basically six thoughts away from being a really bad person. And the, the, you, because he said, well, if I have a bad hole, it's going to be a bad round. If I have a bad <coughs> round, it's going to, I'm going to miss the cut. If I miss the cut, I'm going to have a bad year. If I have a bad year, I'm not going to make any money. If I don't make any money, I'm not a good family. I'm not a good provider for my family. I'm a bad person that fast and they and they just go like that and so the pressure is, is to to perform uh it's a different situation but uh for golf but you know what everybody has the pressure to perform up to their own expectations and i think that that's really the critical thing so when we talk about the mental game it's the same it's the, the same mind is working for everybody and that is the worry about results. And Christ, Christy's fun to work with. She likes acronyms. She came up with this one. When you worry about results, you're at war with yourself. W-A-R, worry about results. So, so for all of us, when we, when we don't trust ourselves, when we lack confidence, when we worry about how things are going to turn out and how we're going to be judged and how we judge ourselves with unrealistic expectations, that's the source of the interference. And that's the source of the unhappiness. And, and to take the example of the pros, how many pros, you know, champ, uh, how many tour players have you heard say, you know what, I was just having too much fun out here playing golf and I decided I needed to grind <laughs> and really and get down on myself. And that's why I won. You don't hear that in the winter circle very often, right? What you hear was I was grinding, I was getting down on myself, I was miserable, I didn't feel like playing anymore, and I said, you know, if I'm going to be out here, I'm just going to, at least I'm going to have some fun. And oh, lo and behold, they won. So um, people think if only I could get better, I'd enjoy, my, I'd enjoy the game more. It actually works the other way around. If you'd enjoy the game more, you'd play better. How do you, how do you take some of these ideas to your teams, like your lead teams, your coworkers? The question Robin, Robin had was, how do you take this to your teams, to your coworkers? You start from you. If you ex engender those qualities, if you express yourself that way, if you are cheerful and, and, and you don't get down on yourself, what happens is the way we treat ourselves and the way we relate to ourselves gets projected out onto others. So you may not be aware of it, but you are treating others the way you treat yourself. If you don't, if, if you're always looking over your own shoulder and you don't trust yourself, you're going to find yourself looking over your employees' shoulders, and they're not going to enjoy that very much. So, um, so applying these principles, first you apply them to yourselves, and then you communicate them in a skillful way to others. And it's really important. Uh, I'll, this, I'm glad you asked that. This is what I was taught. Um, by a, a Zen, a martial arts master. He was the uh, archery teacher um, and bow maker for the Emperor of Japan. And I was, he just, he died recently at the age of 92, and I was very fortunate to study Zen archery with him. 
and he said the samurai code has three points. Listen, help, never give up. Listen to what other people need. And that is genuinely listen without your preconceptions about what you think would be good for them. Try to really hear where they're coming from. And, and that means, and, and this is difficult, but hear beyond their words. Pick up where they're coming from. Their words may not express it, but the, 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 the vibe, the feeling that you get from them, you can ask about it. You say, well, you, you said one thing, but it seems like that your tone wasn't, was expressing something else. Just ask and be open to listen without, and without judgment. Because people won't confide in you if they feel like they're going to be judged by what, by what they say. Second, that's listen. Second is help. Try to give people what they need, not what you think would be good for them, or because very often, suddenly, you're, you're giving them what they need to fulfill your agenda. So really try to take you out of it and say, what can I do to genuinely help from their side? And finally, never give up. Never give up on the potential of others and never give up on yourself. So that's the, that's the message for working with others. Well, I think we should, oh, yes. So many members of clubs, they hit a good on the range, and they, they hit a great on the range, and I didn't play well on the course. What's one or two coaching? Have you ever heard of that? They play well on the range and not on the course? That's a, yes. Which one, one or two? That's pretty much every, so many people. I'm going to say, well, why am I a five on the range and a 15 on the course? That's right. Well, for one thing, this is really interesting. For one thing, you're not as good on the range as you think you are. Okay? Because you hit five shots, you pick the best one, you said, yeah, that's my shot. But you don't get to hit five on the course. And you're not as bad on the course as you think you are because you only get one shot at it. Um, and this, this is interesting. Uh, how many of you have mounds on your rain, on your practice ranges, where you where you hit full shots? Yeah, not too many. So the range, so the range are perfectly flat, right? And and do you just do? You, what if the ball is in a divot? Do you hit it from the divot? No, you break it up and give it a nice lie. Right? So your, your, their shots on the range are from completely <coughs> flat lies, um, uh, uh, completely flat, nice lie, and what's the consequence of a bad shot on the range? You have to rake another ball over, that's right, that's right. So, so they're, they're not as good on the range as they think, as they, think they are. Okay. Uh, I think all ranges should have mounts so you can experience, if, if you have uh, not too steep, but just a mound. You have the back of the mound, you are playing uphill shots. The front of the mound, you're playing downhill shots. Each side, you're playing ball below your feet, above your feet. There are your shots that you're going to experience on the golf course. So about 1% of you have uh, a range with mounds on it. How many of you, uh, what percentage have, uh, all have perfectly flat fairways all the way around the course? Yeah, none. <laughs> this isn't Florida. Anyway, um, so so what you what I have people do is after they've warmed up and hit some shots, I want them to play as I mean I keep they don't have, I, I'd have them go to the side and hit some out of the rough uh, to the side of the range if they can, but at least instead of raking the ball over, drop a ball. I discovered this. It's unbelievable the difference. <coughs> that you experience when you have to play the ball. You, as soon as you rake it over, it doesn't count. <clears throat> you ever rake a ball over on the, on the well, with everybody watching, you ever rake a ball over on, on the course to play your shot? No, you play it as it lies. So on the, on the range, you drop a ball, and wherever it ends up, that's your shot. And, and do your full routine and play the shot, and just one with that club. And then you, you'll get an idea of how you are on the range. And, and on the way to the course, before you leave, play a few imaginary holes just that way on the range. And you'll, you'll go to the first tee as your fourth tee. One more? Yes. I have a question for you. If it was next year's Masters, and you were the medal coach for Jordan Spieth, and you're going around with him like around the 12th hole, 
I would be curious of what would your approach be with them. Uh, the question was, how would I work with Jordan Spieth next year at the Masters? And please give him, like, I have some cards in the back, please give him. Give him <laughs> no, I, I wrote an article for Golf Digest about this. Um, I, I think you can still find it, what, what you learned from Jordan Spieth's Masters experience. Um, what I really appreciate about him was he revealed what was going on with his mind um, at, at the Masters, and I, I did a critique of each point. I'm not going to go through all, all of that, but uh, point one, after nine holes, he said, I got a five-shot lead. I just par in, and I win. He just sent a message to his body, we don't have to play anymore. We're done. We won. That was the subconscious message that he sent in. And he now was, instead of trying to play to make birdies and play good shots, he was trying to just say, you know, just make pars. So everything got tentative in his swing. Uh, he started holding back? No. <laughs> he didn't free it up. He didn't just let it go. He was got a little guiding, got a little tentative. Um, and then, uh, on, number, on number 12, he got out of his play. Uh, he was hitting a little draw all day, and he knew the year before he'd, he'd flared one to the right and, and hit it in the water. But he had a bright idea right there. Now, what's that called, that, that group of holes, Amen Corner? We all have that because it's the point in the round where we're tired, where um, uh, the architect may have put some interesting holes in there. We don't have enough holes to left to make up for a mistake. We're not near, we see the finish line, but we're not near enough for the adrenaline to kick in. All, the, it's like a perfect storm of, of mental challenges. And he got caught. He outthought himself, he said, I think I'll play a fade in there. All he had to do, the worst he could do was hit it in the back bunker like he did and make a bogey. And he ended up parring the back bunker with his third shot. So I would go through all those steps with him and say, um, never say all I need is this to, uh, I just need to par in to win. Um, and what I, I have a simple game plan for players that take the score out of the situation. You can try this your, yourself or with your students. The game plan is, I want to try to make my lowest score on the, the upcoming hole without taking unnecessary risks. That's it. If you're four over with three holes to play, what do you want to do on the next hole? Try to make birdie without taking an unnecessary risk. If you're four under with three holes to play, don't just try to bring it to the house. Try to make birdie without taking an unnecessary risk. Where you are on the, in the round in the score, Nobody turns in a 14-hole score, so your score doesn't matter at that point. Keep playing golf the way you've been playing. So I want to finish with one little story, and that is uh, uh, I'm, going to, I'm going to be going and teaching in Ireland uh, this summer, but uh, I've also taught in Scotland and at, at the British Open, uh, the Open Championship a number of times. And uh, at St. And St. Andrews, is is the home of golf, and this, there's this guy, you know, you're doing raffles, he, he won a raffle for his dream come true around golf at St. Andrews. And so he practiced really hard, he took a lot of lessons, and he just tried to get as good as he could get before he went. And he, he was so, so, so wanting to play his best that he was trying too hard, and on the first hole, he had, he had, a, he had a bad hole. And so he tried harder, and the harder he tried, the worse he got. And the worse he got, the harder he tried, until on the 18th hole, he holds out on the 18th green, and he shot the worst round he's had in 10 years. And he's so dejected, he says to his, his Scottish cat, he says, ah, I feel, so, I feel so bad, I think I'm just going to throw myself into the ocean and drown. And the cat, he said, well, Seb, you can throw yourself in, but you'll never drown. He said, what do you mean? He said, you'll never keep your head down long enough. Yeah. So thank you very much. For your time. <laughs>just about ready to wrap up, but uh, after this, Dr. Joe will be in the back of the room uh, if you've got any questions, any follow-ups for him. Um, again, there's two books he's got out. Uh, if you 
take a look at the Zen Golf. I kind of glanced over it. Um, there's some pretty cool stuff in here. A lot of like good stories. Um, <laughs> uh, and the best dive book. Uh, no, not many of you guys need it. You ladies and gentlemen need it, but I'm sure you have friends who do. <laughs> uh, with that, Mr. McNair, would you like to a few closing words? Thank you very much for that. That was excellent. Uh, now we'd like to bring up uh, Dee Dee Lascar to talk about golf by grips. Dee Dee. Does everybody want to get up and stretch for two seconds? Everybody want to wake up? Stand up? Breathe. Take a couple breaths before. I'm going to be quick with this. So, but I see that we all need a little motion here first. Okay. I was playing golf last week in Arizona and I was telling my playing partners, I'm going to, I'd like to um, maybe co write a book with Dr. Parent on conversations with myself as I stand over the ball. So. Um, before I get started, I want to ask a question. I did this um, presentation last year uh, at the Fall Coaching and Teaching Summit, and one of my bosses asked uh, the crowd, how many of you here actually um, own your regripping business or own your pro shop business? If you could raise your hand. So, um, so that's the reason I'm here today is to try to kind of find out why I sat on a panel for the PGA one time where we discussed why why your members and why the golf a lot of the golfers go to retail to have their clubs regrip. Um, I know when I grew up in Chicago, um, the pro that at our club, he owned the pro shop, he owned the back room, he owned the carts. I mean, it was a very, uh, that was back in the early 70s. And um, as you all know, the golf has, business has changed a lot over the years. So whether, um, whether it's the company that manages your facility, doesn't want to carry an inventory of product, or whether, uh, you know, and, and in the olden days, the club pros were club makers before they were club pros. So, you know, maybe we've gotten away from the art of putting our own equipment together and um, having that passion. So, um, Golf Pride, we have, uh, we don't sell direct to consumers. We sell to distributors who then in turn sell to the green grass. And um, we try to have our business model where our distributors are within. If you called a distributor and said, you know, can I get a set of grips tomorrow? They can uh, put them in the mail and you get them next day or the day after. Um, so that it's something that um, makes your business a little bit easier to do. Um, um, so, and even today, I mean, we're struck, you know, the, the growth of the game and um, just the ability to generate more revenue. If I'm a kid working in the back room and I want to earn a couple extra dollars, I would love it if I had a boss that would give me that opportunity to learn how to regrip grip and, and give me the tools to do it so I could make an extra $30 an hour or um, put a little cash in my pocket. Um, so, one of the things is why don't golfers regrip? Um, they don't know they can. And I do a lot of demo days and I cut off a lot of grips that have been on like the Callaway Big Berthas. Um, you know, people, people don't know that they can regrip their golf clubs. You know, it's just like whether you don't, whether it's changing the tires on your car, changing the windshield wipers on your car. <laughs> We don't think about it in Southern California until 
it rains and you're like, oh, I need new windshield wipers. It's the same thing with changing your golf grips on your golf clubs. And I've got some bag tags back on my table. You know, if you're giving a lesson, you know, and you see a, one of your students has a bad grip, put a tag on their bag and just remind them, hey, you need to, re you know, you can actually regrip these clubs. Um, people don't think about it. It's a hassle. You don't want to get your hands dirty. I get that. Um, it's, it is expensive for, for the budget conscious, but today's day and age, you know, would you rather spend, you know, $150 changing your grips on your clothes or spending $1,000 to buy a new set of golf clubs? Um, and it is confusing. Um, we try to uh, provide some tools on our website so people can actually go on the website to figure out what grip is right for me. I've got some grip sizing guides in the back also um, that can help you help you with that. But from what we see, only one third of the golfers today actually uh, regrip their their clubs. So there's two thirds of an opportunity to reach out to your members to say, hey, when was the last time you regripped your clubs? Per 100 rounds of golf, the average active regrip facility installs 2.5 grips. Does that sound like your facility? Does that seem low? Which I think, I think it does. Um, and you are the expert, you're the expert of taking care of your members. And they are waiting for you to tell him or her, you know, what grips do I need for my clubs? Or that you even need grips for your clubs to enjoy the grip to a higher gain. When I do a demo day, we install one grip complimentary. So, and for all of you, you know what it's like when you put on a new grip versus having an old slick rubber grip that hasn't been changed in a couple of years. Um, and, and your members look up to you. You're the expert in the business and um, they're going to listen to what you say. They want to see what clubs you're playing golf with or what grips you're playing with. Uh, I, I always get asked, what grips are you playing with? Um, so people, people they, they watch, they learn from their PGA professionals. You've got a captive audience and just being able to educate them and let them know it's time to regrip is important. We have an opportunity to identify worn grips during the lessons. Um, you can, obviously you can increase your revenue and get, uh, make margins and profits from regripping. The average professional staff member makes $2 per grip. I see anywhere from maybe a dollar uh, to $3 or is, it, is what an installation fee is. So, on top of that, you know, like I said, if the kid in the back room or if it's something you can offer to one of your staff members in your shop. And as I said earlier, how many people actually own their grip concession? Um, I've talked to, um, you know, people who say, you know, hey, this is down, this is down, but our grips are up. So it's, it's, it's kind of a hidden gem. And until people start really looking at it and seeing what difference it can make in your in your profits and losses um, and is your customer getting the best grip for their game um, some different clubs I know I grew up in the Midwest so in the winter time sometimes head pros would say you know during the off season when you have your clubs in the back room you know we'll regrip your clubs and they'll be ready for next season or I've done some things in the desert where we do a preseason regrip. Or, you know, there's just, you gotta learn how to be creative and, and golf pride and your distributors that we have uh, working for us now, um, we're there to help you and assist you in, in growing that portion of your business. This is just a chart that shows you some of, like what the wholesale price is, what someone might charge installed at retail, the cost versus the revenue versus the profit. So when you put it down on paper, I'm a visual person and I can actually see the pluses and minuses um, and the pluses and the pluses. Um, 
there's a great opportunity here for someone who's interested in putting in the time and making a difference for their members. So Golf Pride and our distributors and Global Tour Golf in the back, who's also here today and also supports the Southern California PGA, they're one of um, Actually, I've been working with them for the past 13 years. And uh, we've helped really grow their business and um, we've had a great partnership. You've got Don Martin here up in uh, the Los Angeles area, Ken Sports. If you go to golfpride.com, you can see uh, we have our distributors listed there where you can uh, pick a distributor to purchase from. But it's nice to support the people that help support you. So Global Tour has been a great partner of ours. Um, distributors can provide next day delivery for inventory, making stocking requirements minimal. We have a plethora of grip displays and floor displays, mobile regrouping units, something we offer to certain facilities to help grow their business. If you have a, a regrouping machine out on the driving range, out of sight, out of mind, they don't think about it. I met the two of the people from Torrey Pines this morning, and I know that they don't do regrouping there. We've talked about it before, but I was like, you know, we can get you a regrouping machine and you can put it on your range and people will think about, you know, actually getting their clubs regripped. So if you have something like that visible, fitting cards to use during the lessons and fittings, we provide a lot of signage, um, email blasts, you can go on to our website and we have uh, on that another slide you'll see uh, where you can go in and tap into some of the media uh, tools that we have for e-blasting. Um, reminder tags and um, web training we have on our website also. These are some of the displays we have available. It's a 10, 10 slot display with, that you could put your our popular grips and then we have a grip sizing display that have the tour wraps with all four sizes so people can touch and feel it. These are some of the email tools that we've created. Promotional shop, shop signs and rugs. We did an awesome uh, skin to wall for Susan Roll at Carlsbad Golf Center and it's really turned out nice. Um, she's been a great partner of ours also. We do a, a promotion with our distributors where they um, have a, uh, a promotional kit. So we give you the kit with 30 grips, shafted samples, and get people to try. Um, whether it be the CP2 or the MCC plus fours, some of our new product. There's golfpride.com, go to Media Center. Media Center, that's where you can access all your um, things that you can use for e-blasting to your members. And please reach out to me or a local distributor, Global Tour Golf, and uh, We'd be more than happy to help you learn how to regroup your business if you're if you're not already doing so. We had a last year was a first year we did a retail contest and um, promoting May, which we just you just lost that window, but um, we just completed that and I think this year we had maybe a hundred and um, close to 160 entries into our retail contest this year with a lot of prizes for the the people that entered. These are some of the things that, different ideas that people can do to help promote the brand. And even on, uh, on the golf carts, on your easy go carts, where they do have um, a place where you can put some signage, you can put something up and uh, Remind them that they can regrip their clubs. Just kind of plant the seed. We do a lot of um, media type of work in Golf Digest, Golf Magazine, the Golf Channel. We help to sponsor the Golf Fix with Michael Breed. He's been a great uh, partner of ours throughout the years.
And here's a, a, one of the pro shops that have actually has their regripping machine right in the pro shop. So it's, um, they're great vehicles doing demo days, helping to get out there in the springtime or whatever. It could be all year round, um, helping to promote people and let them get their clubs ready for the season. So, do you have, does anyone have any questions? Are you guys going to go regrip your clubs right now? <laughs> but it's really important, and it, like I said, if I can help you in any way, Global Tour Golf can help you in any way. Thank you for letting us be one of the partners for uh, the Southern California PGA. Thank you very much, Didi, and thank you for sponsoring today's event. Um, with that in mind, if Max and Spain would please come up to go through today's festivities. While Max is coming up, uh, Mike Vandergoes from the Metro Chapter, I uh, want to remind uh, everyone that their chapter summer meeting is Monday, June 13th, and it's a pro pro event. So. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. President. Um, first and foremost, I want to give a big thank you to Sadakoi Country Club today for hosting the Pro Post Scramble. Um, Mr. Thomas Wolinski behind me here, Mr. Fo Phil Lopez, greatly appreciate all their support. Um, I called Tom at least three times a day for the last two weeks, and for some reason he kept answering my phone calls, so thanks for doing that. Um, I brought him up here. He wants to review a few things um, regarding um, some items you might see on the golf course, and then I will follow up um, with the activities on uh, for the Pro Pro Scramble. So, Tom. Thanks, Max. A couple of things about uh, what we're doing today. Uh, number one, I want to thank our members for letting us use the golf course today. In doing so, I want to remind us all for sand and sea, please fill your divots. A two-person scramble, so we're going to have two big divots pretty much everywhere you go. So if you kindly fill the sand and, se sand and seed with your divots. There's also refill stations on holes 3, 7, 13, 17. You'll see divot boxes there. If you run out of sand, please refill your uh, sand bottles. There are a couple places that we've resodded that are marked ground under repair. I know in the rules of golf, you can play on the ground under repair. We'd ask you though, please, does the scram, will you move the ball off those newly sodded areas and not play out of that ground under repair that's newly sodded? Uh, again, we just got about four or five spots on the back nine. If you've not played on that side, we'd really appreciate that. Uh, the golf carts are all staged out on the road outside. When you go outside, front number one, back number 18, so you all find where you're located from your holes. On uh, holes 2, 7, and 16 are cart path only, 2, 7, and 16. Uh, those holes do have signs on them. I know we don't read signs, but if you happen to read, read the signs, then remember, be nice to stay off holes numbers 2, 7, and 17. The driving range. Driving range will be available for your use. The balls will be out there. You'll notice there'll be two separate colored golf balls. There's white and yellow. Uh, the driving range is 309 yards to the man's house at the end of the driving range. And the windows are $455 a piece that you break. <laughs> I know personally. So, and we've just paid a couple of those bills. So please, uh, the yellow balls are limited flight. If you're going to hit drivers or you're very long, please use the limited flight balls for anything over 235 yards or so. Uh, there's bathrooms located at holes number 6 and 14. Uh, we ask you to be sensitive to our neighbors in that respect. If, you're gonna, if you can't wait for one of those holes, please be discreet. We do have members and houses around the golf course. They don't really appreciate. Um, I'll stop right there. You know what I'm getting to. <laughs> uh, we have included today after golf day. We'll meet in the bar. Uh, we'll have some snacks available. There will be bar service available after playing Satakoy 18 holes of golf here. I know I'll be at the bar. <laughs> I'll see you all there. I don't think it's going to be a little bit testing out there, I guarantee you that. I'd like to welcome you all. I hope you all have fun today. Uh, see you after golf. Thank you very much, Tom. Um, located on all your tables, you will find the groupings um, and your start holes. So if you kind of review those, make sure you can see which start holes you will be going out on. Um, also, for your change of your attire, um, from your business attire to your golf attire, we please ask that you use a locker room. Uh, the locker room is located right downstairs. You'll find the stairs right around the corner there. So please go down there to change into your golf attire before heading out. Um, as 
<laughs> spoiler alert there. Um, located on your golf cars, you will find um, your scorecard, your notice to competitor, um, as well as your whole location sheet. In addition to that, you will find your box lunches. Thanks for the reminder, Tom. So you can eat your box lunch there um, prior to warming up. Um, like he said as well, the driving range, please pay respect to, to the yardage restrictions there, 230 yards. Um, the yellow balls are the restricted flight balls, so please use those if you eat anything over 230 yards. Um, now to kind of review the notice to the competitors that you will find on your golf cart. Um, the tees today, the men's will be playing the black course tee markers. The women's will be playing from the, the uh, gold course tee markers. The format will be an 18-2 man scramble. Um, we, for the, uh, the ball that is chosen through the green, you have one club length, no nearer to the hole. And for the ball that you choose on the green, um, one putter length, no nearer to the hole. Putter headline. Putter headline, yeah. On hole number six, um, you may encounter power lines there. If you hit a power line there, um, it's a cancellation of stroke and you must replay that shot. So um, just to bring that to your attention, there's a power line on number six that could come and play today. Pace of play today, we have 52 teams, so let's make it an enjoyable day for everyone and play ready golf, two-man scramble. I know with this format, we can uh, play ready golf and then have a very enjoyable day out there. So pace of play, let's all keep that in mind. And then in an event of a, uh, a tie for overall champion, we will have an on-course playoff. So again, you'll see all these items on your uh, notice to competitors that is located in your golf cart that is staged out front. Scoring will be located in this room right behind us where we will be serving some uh, light hors d'oeuvres and some drinks as well. Um, so report there for your scoring um, up on completion of play today. Um, and finally, we will have a team skins. Um, there will be a $20 team skins uh, and the buy-in will be located at the tent down there by the driving range. So as y'all are down there um, warming up, please come over and visit me and uh, Mr. Kevin Smith. Uh, if you would like to participate in the Team Skins $20 buy-in. Finally, I'd like to thank uh, the PGA professionals, Mr. Ron O'Connor and Mr. Mark Wynn for coming out today and assisting in the rules officials. Um, you'll see them out there today on the front and the back nine helping you out. So if you have any troubles today, um, they'll be there to assist you. So thank you both for um, donating your time today. Then finally, I want to thank uh, all the support and contributions from the partners today for making this a terrific purse. Um, we have a 14,500 purse today we're planning for, and that couldn't be done without uh, um, uh, our presenting sponsor, EasyGo, and all the other kind of partners that we have here today. Question? Does the rule sheet talk about changing the grass for the club length and the fairway? No, it doesn't. Just do the green. Do the club No, no, trust me. Just do the green. Club, club length through the green. So at this time, um, it is approximately um, 10.56. We will set the shotgun start to begin at 12.15. Now will give you about an hour and 20 minutes to change your clothes, get a box lunch, a few balls, get loose. So 12.15 will be the official start time for the Pro Pro Scramble. I want to thank you all for coming out. Thanks to Easy Go, and I'm looking forward to a great day. And thanks to Satikoy Country Club. Thanks. and Tom, thank you so much for this wonderful day. And with that, meeting adjourned. Enjoy the rest of your afternoon.